welcome back everyone shikha will be starting sharp at 3 so another 6 minutes from now shikha you can hear me shikha are you able to unmute yourself or no just give me a Um, so if you are not able to Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to begin with the session shortly.
am I audible? Yes, yes, you are now. Um, the sun himself is weak when he first rises and gathers strength and courage as the day gets on, says Charles Dickens. Good afternoon to one and all present here to honored guests, dignitaries, faculty members, and dear students. I am Shikha Kukreja, your host of this evening. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the 17th International Conference on Management Strategies, Retrieval, Resilience, and Remodeling in a Post-COVID World. Organized by IQAC and Department of Management Studies, Jagannath International Management School, Vasan Kunj. The Institute was established in 2003 by Jagannath Gupta Memorial Education Society, which has been an academic leader for over 20 years with eight higher education institutes of academic excellence in Delhi NCR and three in Rajasthan. One of which, Jagannath University, has been established to enact Rajasthan Assembly as a private university at Jaipur, and yet another private state university by the same name at Bahadurgar, Haryana. The Jagannath Gupta Memorial Education Society has been blazing a trail in higher and professional education. In the 20 years of its existence as an academic leader, Jagannath Gupta Memorial Education Society has been keenly conscious of its responsibility towards innovations in pedagogy, women power requirements of the industry and community outreach. In keeping with these overriding concerns, society has been laying emphasis on grooming leaders who can be assets to both the industry and society. Jagannath International Management School, Vasan Kunj New Delhi, accredited by NAC with A grade and approved by the UGC, the Institute has been conducting three-year degree programs in journalism, information technology, and management studies. The Institute has the distinction of being the only college with the maximum number of gold medals awarded to its BAJMC students in the university. The Institute is also a participant member of United Nations Global Compact and United Nations Principles for Responsible Management Education, New York, USA. Besides, the Institute is a member of Innovation Cell, Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India, and the Unnad Bharat Abhiyan, Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India. Also, the Institute has a distinction of undertaking research consultancy projects for the Department of Science and Technology, National Human Rights Commission, Indian Council, of, uh, Indian Council of Social Science Research, and Child Fund India. As a part of its community orientation, the Institute has a community radio station, an eco club, NSS unit, and Rotaract club. GEMS also has tie up for online certificate programs for its students and alumni with prestigious Harvard Business School. To enable knowledge building and give life enriching experience to its students, GEMS has signed MOU with international organizations like Russian news agency Sputnik and Singapore Institute of Management. The Department of Management Studies has won many laurels for the Institute, including a gold medal in academics and five gold medals in IP University sports tournament for the holistic development of students and to establish conducive teaching learning environment the department strives to impart quality education for facilitating innovation and critical thinking the vision of our chairman dr amit gupta mentorship of the director dr ravi kethar and the able leadership of the head department dr nidhi gupta the department has organized this conference on the current prevailing situation now a special mention for our sponsors, media partners, and strategic partners. Tocido, our sponsor, is a one-stop destination for fashion accessories with a premium product ranging from neckties, bow ties, pocket square, cufflinks, to much more. Campusly, our media partner, is one-stop platform for college news and media, serves as a platform for students of all streams to stay updated about college events, academic activities, webinar, conference, MUN, internship, among several things. Our media partner, Youth Delhi, is an independent student-run community based in Delhi University, one of the largest campus publications in India for all the DU societies and departments to promote their events. In Saiton, 
Our student outreach partner is a one-stop destination for anything and everything that comes under the big umbrella of our youth. Colony Gigs is our media partner, is an Indonesian community media that focuses on music and art events such as concerts, festival gigs, or events related to music. Now the strategic partner of our is Young Indians. It is a movement for Indian youth to converge, let co-create and influence India's future as an integral part of CII. The organization plays a proactive role in India's development process. CII, our strategic partner, the Confederation of Indian Industry works to create and sustain an environment conducive to the development of India, partnering industry, government, civil society through advisory and consultative process. I would like to express my sincere thanks to you all for sponsoring and becoming our media and strategic partner for our 17th international conference. Success comes with struggle and life begins at the end of your comfort zone, says one of our experts, Dr. Munish Shindan. In the past, we have organized 16 national international conferences and seminars. And despite the enormous hurdles created by COVID-19, we have risen to the challenge and have organized 17th international conference in the online mode. The conference is an attempt to examine and understand the unprecedented slowdown which has led to the new opportunities for businesses to reinvent themselves and decipher new models of growth and sustenance as the older models are no longer valid in this uncertain time. The pandemic has also exposed the flip side of the economy. The new normal presents enormous opportunities to bounce back by implementing effective strategies. To discuss over the subject, we have amongst us a galaxy of intellectuals. Mr. Sanjay Bhan, Head Global Business at Hero Motor Corp Limited, Neeraj Walia, CEO at Monblanc India, Dr. Justin Paul, Professor, University of Puerto Rico, San Juan, PR, USA, and Distinguished Professor, IIM Kerala and SIBM. Dr. Viola Edward, Partner and Executive Director at Creative Women Platform, CEO, Co-Owner at Grit Academy. Ms. Luke Dwarf, TEDx Speaker, Talent Coach, and Author from Belgium. Dr. Manish Chindal, Founder and CEO, Hover Robotics, Founding President, Mentor X Global. Our esteemed Chairman, Dr. Amit Gupta. And our Chief Guest of the Evening, Mr. Rohit Khosla, Executive Vice President Operation, Indian Hotels Company Limited. Last but not the least, star of the evening, renowned globally as Guru of Marketing, Professor Philip Potler as our guest of honor. I take this opportunity to extend a very warm welcome to our guest today. Can we have the virtual applause for our guest, please? Thank you. I hope our students and faculty will derive great intellectual delight from listening to them and benefit from their words of wisdom. Leadership is not a position or title, it's action and example. Now I would like to introduce a leader who has led the management department with action and example, HD Management, Dr. Nidhi Gupta. She's a postgraduate in international business and PhD in commerce. Her expertise and interests are in human resource, international business, economics, and management subjects. She has rich experience in academia and currently working as head department management studies with Jim Sankunj. She has received research grants from ICSSR on project of WASH attitudes in 2019. She has also authored more than 30 research papers published in various international and national research journals. She has also presented more than 25 research papers at various national and international conferences. She is a resource person of faculty development program in the field of research and SPSS and continuously working as member of organizing committee for conference seminars and workshops. She also visited Bhutan to teach management student of Royal University Bhutan under the International Faculty Exchange Program. She has convened several faculty development programs and workshops sponsored by Government of India. She has chaired various national and international conferences as session chair. She's research supervisor for PhD students management in various universities like James University, Jaipur, Pacific University, Udaipur, Amity University, Nevada University, Rajasthan. 
She is an editorial advisory board member of our four international and, journal, and international and national journal of repute. I would like to request Dr. Nidhi Gupta, Head of Department Management Study, please deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Shikha, for your kind words. I hope I am audible to all. Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, Dr. Nidhi Gupta, on behalf of James Basan Kunj, extend a hearty welcome to esteemed chairman, sir, respected director, sir, the star-studded panel of speakers, research scholars, my colleagues from the academic fraternity across the globe, my beloved students, to the second part of the 17th International Conference on Management Strategies, Retrieval, Resilience, and Remodeling in the Post-COVID World. The thought behind choosing this theme for this conference was not instant. The prevailing situation made us analyze and realize the responsibility as a premium management institute to set the platform which offer and welcome the needful management strategies, which in turn assure the retrieval, resilience and remodeling in the business domain post COVID. And as elaborated by the anchor, we have witnessed the incredible and thoughtful research work in the first half of the conference in the morning. In 2020, the first wave, and at present, the second wave of this pandemic has completely transformed the ways an enterprise was working and will have an everlasting impact on the ways organizations are going to work in the future. The organization's change management is the key tool to discover new ways to lead build resilience and develop strong prediction skills to manage this transformation and enabling the employees to adapt to the new normal. COVID-19's biggest impact is on people and hence organizations have to first focus on employees' well-being and safety and then, <clears throat> then they need to uh, uh, they need to include uh, the educating and supporting employees in managing the crisis and creating the awareness about the precautions, regulatory compliances, and then their continuity in the business domain. The employee safety through remote working, empowered virtual teams, and customer support will ensure the business con continuity in the future as well. There has been a shift in the international socio-political landscape, wherein the world's most influential economies like China, USA, and now India have struggled to cope up with the challenges posed by this pandemic. But according to me, the COVID-19 situation offers both opportunities and challenges to the business leaders, and they are responding based on the culture and vision of the organization. The progressive organizations are looking to transform their business models and new ways of working in place of merely reacting to the current situation. The current period will derive multiple transformations in an organization's way of working and require a differentiated change management strategy in the area of marketing, recruiting, production, and many other fields which needs to be focused on consistent communication, coaching, training, and learning to adopt new ways of working that were never envisaged earlier. The organizations are following different prospects to be future ready, like rapid reskilling of the employees by teaching them how to build a learning mindset. It will prepare them well for dealing with the constantly, even sometimes abruptly changing environment and changing leadership and management competences as there is no blueprint for what we are facing and business leaders around the world are changing strategies to keep up in tandem with honing the digital skills and an improved infrastructure. It is necessary that corporate culture and leadership skills focus on empathy as transformation and disruptions becomes the new normal. Control has to some extent uh, given way to trust, people are learning how to do work disruptively and with far less oversight. They are learning on the job what works and what does not work at home and holding virtual meetings that might have happened 
before, but never to such an extent. Ironically, in the midst of this social distancing, many of us are getting closer. We are building more adaptive teams, are more constantly in touch with each other, and connections has become a priority in the name of working remotely. But beyond that, we are connected with the purpose and as a community. Today at this conference, we have the galaxy of experts who will be sharing their words of wisdom with us as per the theme. And then we will be fortunate to hear the father of modern marketing, Guru Professor Kotler, live in this session. It is the dream of many of us coming through today. I welcome once again all of you on behalf of James Vasan Kunj Delhi and looking forward to have lots of learning and takeaways from all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Dr. Nadi for this wonderful welcome address. And you very rightly said that we have to adapt the new normal and embrace this new normal. Moving on. Thank you so much once again, Dr. Nadi. Moving on. You are braver than you believe and stronger than you seem and smarter than you think, says AA Mind. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the director of Jim's Vasan Kunch, Dr. Ravi Kethar, the sculptor of human character and navigator of the flagship of this knowledge. He's a doctorate in English and, uh, from Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, and Master of Journalism in Mass Communication from Himachal Pradesh University, Shimla. Dr. Dhar started his career as a lecturer in English at Northeastern Hill University, Shillong. He has taught English and journalism at Punjab Agriculture University, Ludhiana, Ethiopian Civil Services University, Addis Ababa. Dr. Dhar has published papers in English literature, education, and mass communication. Apart from presenting papers in conferences like Stockholm, Bangkok, and Shanshan, he has published three books, one in mass communication, another in management, and third is a novel. He has been impaneled as quality expert in mass communication by NAC Bangaluru. He is presently the member of Academic Council of GGS IP University and nominated to the court of Guru Gobind Singh in the Prasa University in 2011. He has a personal website by the URL Ravi K. Dhardin and has two blogs in his name. He has also been awarded Poise India Award for Contribution to Peace and Understanding. Now I would like to request our director, Dr. Ravi K. Dhar, to please share his words of wisdom. Thank you very much, Shikha. I think I'm audible. Yes, you are audible, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. First of all, I would like to welcome on behalf of our esteemed chairman, our faculty and staff and students, all the distinguished speakers who would be speaking today in the post-lunch session. Uh, Mr. Rohit Khasla, uh, Khosla, beginning with Mr. Rohit Khosla, Mr. Sanjay Bhan, Mr. Neeraj Walia, Dr. Justin Paul, Dr. Viola, Edward de Glanville, Mr. Luke T. Wolf and Dr. Munish Jindal. And yes, certainly, Professor Philip Kotler will be joining us later in the evening. Coming to the theme of the conference, the theme of the conference is highly relevant and it was deliberately, as Nidhi, Dr. Nidhi was saying, it was with great care that this subject was chosen because this is something very topical and this is some, something which concerns the lives of most of us, not just as ordinary, as, as ordinary citizens, but also as members of business organizations, educational institutions, because it has affected each and every one of us in various and multifarious ways. One thing that I believe that this COVID-19 has made us realize, apart from the resilience, retrieval, and remodeling strategies that businesses and other educational institutions and social organizations have resorted to as a challenge, as a challenge mechanism, as a mechanism to meet this challenge, is which I, for which I take a cue from what happened when the waves struck for the first time in the USA. Look at 
the paragon of excellence, economic excellence, business excellence, and economy which is touted as something to be emulated by each and every other country, suddenly being humbled, brought down to its knees, just because the health infrastructure of the country failed miserably in protecting the lives of the citizens. What comes out as a lesson from this is that no matter how advanced you are economically, no matter what your GDP figures are, what your standard of living is touted to be, if this development is not with a social orientation, does not look towards the weaker, the those segments of the population which deserve attention and also to the social parameters of development and those are ignored and there is an asymmetrical development across the sectors just because the gains are greater in certain sectors and the gains are lesser in other sectors then there is something wrong with the society. In India, we coined the concept of dharma for this. Dharma is nothing but the law of balance, which ensures that not only does the individual grow, but there is a commensurate development in the society. And when the society develops, its gains also transfer to the development of the individual. So there is not a, not a contrarian position between the individual and the community, but the communitarian interest and the individual interest cohere, commingle, and harmonize in such a way that everyone is taken care of. Now, what has happened in most economies is that the trajectory of development has been such that certain segments of the population which should have garnered more attention and keeping in view the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the initiative launched by UNGC in, the, in terms of UNPRME, where again the emphasis has been on prioritizing management education in these sectors so that the UN SDG goals are attained, that I believe has not been taken up with so much seriousness and earnestness as it should have been. Otherwise, the best of economies would not have been brought down to its knees when COVID-19 struck and hospitals got overwhelmed and there was no infrastructure in terms of ventilators, oxygen cylinders, concentrators, PPE kits, everything was a failure. Yes, it goes to the credit of the economy of these economies that they responded in time later on and they scrambled up all the resources, mustered all the resources and now they are in a better position compared to what we find here in India. So my take therefore is that COVID-19 response should also keep in mind impact investing which is still in its infancy in India. And I was in fact going through the impact investing in India and I don't find that much of impact investing has happened in the health infrastructure at, at a time when it should have happened the most. The second response, so this makes me realize, this makes me feel that COVID-19 should make all businesses aware of their social responsibility. It is not just the Profits, the bottom line profit that you earn, that is important. And yes, we have devised retrieval mechanisms. We have devised remodeling strategies, incorporating IT in a big way. 
making work from home an effective strategy for bringing businesses back onto the rails but then the social responsibility aspect also needs to be taken care of the public health infrastructure in india is to speak less uh, it's i think the less we speak about it the better is not very rosy and the private health infrastructure in india has literally fleeced the middle class so there is a um, something missing somewhere that what dr nidhi spoke of as empathy that empath that element of empathy somewhere is missing we need to realize that human life is more precious that human beings are not just cogs in the wheel that mechanistic and classical management concept of human resources needs to be done away or probably it still continues as a vestige of the past in our management thinking and that needs to be done away with and we need to realize that businesses need to be sensitive and businesses need to invest in the impact investing areas so that an economy is able to meet challenges of this kind thank you very much and wish you all happy listening and a surfeit of intellectual ideas from the best of speakers in the corporate world thank you very much thank you so much dr sir and it was indeed a pleasure to listen to you always and you rightly said we all need to understand our social responsibility thank you once again dr dar moving on be positive be confident and be open to learning with can do attitude this is the saying of our first guest speaker dr munis jindal who is the founder and ceo of over robotics and founding president of mentor x global he is a man of his dreams he has been endowed with many qualities a serial entrepreneur robust not international business consultant philanthropist fashion icon brand ambassador intellectual speaker corporate trainer mentor and angel investor he is an mba cpa and phd in robotics and artificial intelligence from sydney australia imparting knowledge is the mission of his life and he is working towards this by providing free education for unprivileged spreading autism awareness in association with darpan school of autism He has been appointed as mentor of change by the government of India Niti Aayog and also a mentor for Morris. Dr. Munish is a part of the biggest inter-globe faith movement 2019 and the biggest women empowerment initiative of Womenator. He has been honored with 150 plus awards. He has been conferred with highest civil honor in the the uh, the karamveer chakra by united nations i congo and the noble asian of the year 2018 the mentor of the year 2020 by international education icon awards honored by potler awards at wms 2020 honored by indian institute of technology indore dr munish has been honored and awarded as the exceptional leader of excellence at wef and honored by punjab agriculture university for artificial intelligence and robotics he will be speaking on topic ai driven successes it's indeed an honor to have you sir i would now request dr munish to enlighten the audience with his kind words on to you thank dr munish thank you so much namaste from india to all the national as well as international audience thank you so much shikha ma'am for such kind words i'm indeed humbled first of all i really want to congratulate james for this wonderful international conference this is the need of the hour and i could owe to james for making this happen the james being the pioneer um, among the pioneers in the world is making this international conference happen about resilience remodeling restructuring and getting towards the post covid world thank you so much let's see how this is going to happen to us how this artificial intelligence and ai driven processes in the post covid world is going to drive us and going to facilitate our life towards a much better world so how how you think it's going to drive your life let me quickly showcase you there's a call that gets placed to your favorite pizza joint you are, you want to order a pizza today hi is this pizza delight the caller is saying google says no sir it's google pizza 
wow, it's amazing. I feel I have dialed the wrong number. Sorry. Google says, no, sir. Google bought the pizza delight last month. Caller, oh, okay. I would like to order a pizza. Google says, do you want your usual, sir? And my usual, do you know me? I'm a little surprised. According to your caller ID data sheet, the last 12 times you called and you ordered an extra large pizza with three cheese, capsicum, mushroom, onions, baby corn, and aeropilons on thick crust. Oh, totally surprised. Okay, yes, that's what I want. Google says, may I suggest that this time you are a pizza with ricotta, arguana, salt, dried tomatoes, olives, on a whole wheat gluten-free thin crust. What? No, I don't like that. Not at all. So Google says, your cholesterol is not good, sir. And I'm amazed. How on earth do you know about my cholesterol now? Google, well, we cross-referenced your home phone number with your medical records. We have the result of your blood tests for the last seven years. Oh, what? Last seven years? No, whatever. Still, I don't want, want that rotten vegetable pizza. I want, I'm already taking medicine for my cholesterol. Google, excuse me, sir, but you have not taken your medic medication regularly. According to our database, you purchased only a box of 30 cholesterol tablets once at chemist and drug store four months ago. What? Well, you don't know. I bought it from another drug store. That doesn't show in your credit card statement. I paid in cash. Does that bother you? Google, but you did not withdraw enough cash according to your bank statement. I have other sources of cash. Google, you did not withdraw enough cash according to all other relevant sources. And this doesn't show in your last tax return until unless you bought them using an undeclared income source, which is against the law. What the hell? What is it happening to me? Google, I'm sorry, sir. We are using such information only with the sole intention of helping you. Oh, yes, right. How I can see how much you're helping me enough already. I'm tired of Google, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, and all the others. I'm going to an island without internet, cable TV, where there is no cell phone service and no one to watch me or spy on me. Google, I understand, sir, but you need to renew your passport first. It expired six weeks ago. There you go. Kaboom. That's what technology is. That is how AI is going to drive our life. That, that's what been asked from me, that how AI, what are AI processes, how they are going to, going to drive the world. So I thought, let me first showcase you how AI is going to drive your life. This is the beauty of AI. All of you must have seen these wonderful drones, how these autonomous flying machines can keep an eye, can, can keep monitor, can monitor our uh, work uh, places, and lot many more things with AI. But now I let you know what we are going to, we are doing at Over Robotics, what we are make, um, happen, making to happen. On your screens, you are going to see a video. Yes, there you go. And I hope this is going to pep up your afternoon. Let me quickly showcase if it is going to play the music. I don't know whether it's playing the music. Let's go without the music, doesn't matter. So this is what we are doing. We are going to make you fly. Yes. They say COVID, pandemic, stay away, social distancing. But how about each one of you flying in the air? We are making this overboard. That is going to make you fly each one of you in the air. And it could be possible that next time when gyms invite us for an international conference in the real world, each one of us is landing to their campus on these. So gear up, James. Kindly make few of the helipads for us so that we can land up in your uh, camp on these flying hoverboards. Dr. Manish Chindal, sorry to interrupt you, but your video is not visible. It's not visible? No, not at all. With me? Yeah, now it's, it's visible. Yeah, it's better. Yes. Okay. So is it playing well? Seems so, sir, but it's lagging. Oh, lagging that, that we cannot help. We need a much yes. faster that will come with the time post covid world so till the time being enjoy this so this is a real life video this is not a concept you're seeing this is a real life video you're seeing on your screens and this is going to happen to each one of us we are going to fly and there we go 
So artificial intelligence, robotics is coming from the virtual world to the real world. It can help us big time in our personality development. AI can let us know what kind of human beings we are. It can let us know our personality traits just with the movement of our eye. And it can even make a special map of our face through AI algorithms. And it can let us know what could be our future career or what kind of human being we are going to shape up in the future. Here you are seeing a robot and a kid doing their identical actions. We might be thinking the robot is doing as per the kid is uh, the kid is doing as the robot is doing, but it's the vice versa. The robot is doing as the uh, identical to, to the kid. So technology has advanced so much that it can mimic human brain and it can uh, mimic our human gestures as well. AI can read our body reflexes as well. Imagine a camera in your room. You get up. You walk. You move, even you take a side turn on your bed and AI taking note of each of your action, each of your body reflexes, letting you know what areas in body you, or your body are stronger, what area areas of uh, in your body require certain improvements and what kind of future ailments you can face. AI is changing the world big time and we are entering the brave world of mind, matter, computing and intelligence. Yes, this is the world where we are going to work together with the AI intelligence. So what exactly is AI intelligence? We are human beings, are, we are naturally intelligent. But when we solve something that is called solving the intelligence, that is AI. But what to do by solving the intelligence? Use it to solve everything else. Make life easier. Solve the problems around. Every problem you solve around is the next unicorn, next data can idea in for each one of you. Here on your screens, you're seeing BMW manufacturing unit. Earlier, how cars were made, they used to be man-made. They used to be assembled on the assembly line by the humans. But now the trend has changed due to the advent of AI. The Kuka robots from Japan, they are assembling the entire manufacturing car for the BMWs. Here you are seeing the BMW engineers. They are clicking pictures of the car from various different angles, taking note of the car model, the car series. They are feeding it to AI engine. And what this AI engine is doing, they are now capable of assembling the entire car taking note of what car it is, which model number is it, which series is it, and then they can assemble. Here on screen, you can see the BMW engineer. He is installing the car series number on the body shell so that AI softwares, AI algorithms, those cameras, they can correctly identify the car. Then these body shells are sent to the assembly line where these computers, they assemble the entire car right from the transmission, engine, seats, seat belts, steering rack, headlights, anything and everything. Even these systems are so capable that BMW has a standard of seven layers of paint. And these uh, systems, they can even measure those seven uh, layers of paint. And if there are any deviations, they are able to communicate with each other through their cybernetic systems. This is the beauty that which what is not vis visible to our hum naked human eye, the systems can see. They have their own neural networks whereby they can see, they can communicate, they can fix. And these systems, they are even keep track of the entire inventory, that how much inventory they have used, how much inventory is left over, and how much more inventory they need to order. Here we are bringing this AI in the ag uh, agriculture as well. This is a AI smart tractor that you're seeing here. It is capable of measuring moisture, nutrients in the soil. It can even, it is equipped with uh, image a vision that it can foresee uh, infected crop and it would sprinkle pesticides only on that particular infected crop, not on the entire crop. So we can have much more food and better quality of food. This is a even much more interesting technology. We are sitting at home, pandemic is going on, we can move out. So imagine if all of us have to be together at some place, maybe at gyms itself, but we cannot go out. So how about if I say that we can teleport you? Yes, you heard it right. Till now, you must have heard this terminology in the Hollywood movies, but through technology, now you can be, your holographic clone can be transported, can be teleported, can be projected in any part of the world, be it while you're sitting in Delhi, be it Bangalore, be it Hyderabad, or it is UK, Spain, Japan. And the best part is your holographic clone is way more smarter than you, way, way, way more smarter than you that it could be possible that you're only capable of speaking English or maybe Hindi or maybe any other regional language. But what about Arabic? What about Spanish? But what about Japanese? Your holographic clone can speak any given language in the world. It can be trained. It can be programmed in your voice tone, in your accent, the way you speak, your voice modulations. So that when your holographic clone is projected across the world, imagine it feels like that it's the real you talking to them. 
How about if I let you know that mobile phones would be soon obsolete? We won't be using mobile phones anymore. And when we are going to place a call to someone, what is going to happen? That we are virtually going to be sitting next to them, standing next to them. Imagine this conference happening virtually. We all are sitting at our homes, but our holographic clones being projected, we're sitting right next to each other. That is there. That is the mini uh, holographic clone on her hand. And you are going to see it getting transformed into a real life size clone of her, identical clones, totally identical like her, speaking alike her, uh, even the voice modulations and accents are like her, and, but much more intelligent than her that it could talk and deliver a keynote in any language. There you go. Stay focused on your screens. That is the beauty that is you are seeing right there in front of you. Boom. There you go. Can you see two identical human beings? Same clothes, same voice tones, everything identically same. This is the technology. This is the AI driven process that is going to happen. So AI is in every sphere of our life. The most frequent case uses are image analysis. Facebook can recognize our image. Virtual assistant, you can go down to our website, www.hoverrobotics.com, and you can talk to me there as well. Right now I'm sitting here with you. How is it possible that I can talk to you there as well? As a virtual assistant TDO that is taking care of me there at my website, it, it will talk to you on my behalf. Predictive analysis, when whatever you are, uh, human behavior that can be predicted even before you are going to take a decision. Machine learning, then when machines learn from their own environment and self-driving cars. I got a chance to sit in one of them in Hong Kong in year 2016. I was standing by the roadside. A uh, self-driving car came in the rear door uh, popped open. I sat in the car and it took out uh, my destination location from my mobile phone through Bluetooth. As you can see in the car, there's no one in the driver's seat. People are sitting in the passenger seat and this is going to drop them to their destination using optimal route and it knows the next red light camera. It knows the speed limit. It knows the pedestrian. So it is much more safer, much more advanced way to ride the car. Yeah, is in medicine as well. What you're seeing exactly on your screens, these are the normal tablets, capsules, pills that we take when we fall sick. How about if I say in future, you don't have to take this. Imagine a senior citizen who have to take uh, pills for diabetes or high BP, low BP every day and they forget. This is a robotic pill that will go down in your body. It can stay for a day, for a week, for a month, and it can deliver timely doses. You never ever have to take medicine again. You won't have to remember your medicines. We fall sick for fever, paracetamol three days. We have sore throat, antibiotics for seven days, three times a day. We have to remember medicine after every meal. And when now we fall sick, we take curative measures that when we fall sick, then we take medicine. In future, AI is going to make this life so advanced that we are not going to fall sick. Rather, we are going to have preventive measures. Remember, I told you that it can take note of our body reflexes. Taking note of our body reflexes, taking note of our history, it can let us know that this is a future ailment. This is a future disease we might face and can let us know medicines beforehand. And this robotic pill can stay inside our body, delivering us timely doses. AI, AI processes are everywhere. Internet of things, cloud servers, cloud computing, cybersecurity, robotics, biotechnology, nanotechnology, augmented reality, virtual reality, crypto, blockchain, ro robotronics, mechatronics. You talk about AI is driving our life, AI driving our processes. This is the mind sphere uh, developed by Siemens. It is backward compatible. It could be adopted into any manufacturing units maybe wind turbines, uh, railways, aerospace, or fasteners. Talk about any small, big, medium-sized manufacturing unit. They have developed small nano sensors that can be deployed in the existing manufacturing unit, whereby AI can take care of the entire manufacturing process right from the quality to the quantity. AI is in sports as well. Imagine you want to be a wonderful sports person in your life and you don't know what sports to play or how to play it. How about if I let you know that AI would help you in developing a sports person inside you. Imagine your camera with an app on a badminton court. It can take note of how you twisted your wrist, how high you held your racket, how high you jumped, what, what are the strong points in your opponent, how weak you are, what were the weak points of you, and carving a better niche out of you. I use this to play golf. I love playing golf, and I use certain AI apps to play golf already. Wow, this is e-mobility. This is my favorite. This is what I do 
this is what we made. We are the pioneers of e-mobility in India. We are the ones who launched hoverboards, uh, electric mobility, autobots, mobility robots in India. You can stand on it. You can go from point A to point B. It is electrically chargeable, no fuel, no petrol, no diesel, no pollution. And the best part is it moves the way you think. When you think, your body generates re body reflex. It can sense 200 reflexes per second. So the new norm is going to be think to move. Just think, stand on it, go anywhere you want. Keep it charging, no after expense, and you can go from anywhere, any point to any point. And if any one of you, you want to experience this in the real world, you're most welcome to come down to our Hope Robotics Experience Center and you can experience them. They exist for real. There is one in my hand as well, if you can see. There you go, smaller one, one in my hand. And now these are the Kiva robots. I come across this question a lot many times that AI might reduce the job opportunities or certain human beings, they, they feel it a threat to humanity or they say it would eat up jobs. But here I really want to showcase you that it's always human beings with technology, human beings working hand in hand with AI robots. This is, these are Kivas, 20,000 Kiva robots are deployed in Amazon warehouse, whereby these human beings, as you can see, are very happy, smiling, cause earlier they had to themselves lift heavy weights in the warehouse. They themselves had to lift the goods. Now they sit comfortably in their chairs, pressing touch screen on their uh, computers. And these Kiva robots are taking care of the entire process for them. Each Kiva is capable of lifting 320 kgs. It can remember 10 million items and it, it brings the entire aisle to them they take out the inventory, whatever they want, and Kiva can remember whatever you have taken out, how much inventory was there already, and how much more it needs to order. Kiva is equipped with machine vision, image recognition. It can recognize you as well. It can recognize other Kivas, and it functions smoothly. So this is the best use case, best scenario where robots working hand in hand with human beings. AI is in coming in farming as well, big time has already showcased you the tractor that we have were deployed in agriculture university and why why farming because we are already 8 billion people soon we are going to be 10 billion people population is going to increase by 25 percent but we need extra 60 percent food food is already scarce resource so when ai is coming it can measure uh, moisture in the soil it can measure nutrients in the soil so whether we need fertilizers or not it can measure moisture it can predict rainfall it can predict weather it will let us know how much how we can do agriculture with less of water. So, and it can even let us know which crop we shall sow so that we get the maximum yield. So even before sowing the crop, AI can let us know the harvest we are going to yield. So this AI is big time helping in farming. This is an interesting robot you would see on your screen. This is a tomato harvester. You would see a very interesting process happening on the screen right now. This tomato harvester is equipped with image recognition and machine vision so as you can see there are five colors of tomatoes green red orange yellow and dark green but what exactly this uh, hot tomato harvester is doing it is harvesting the ripened tomatoes rest of them it is letting them grow naturally so that we can have more food and better quality of food this video night right now you're seeing is a robo dog this has been shot around three months ago in one of the most busiest parts, parks of Singapore, where people come together to sit, chit chat, talk. This robot dog is enforcing social distancing. It is asking people to stay away from each other, follow social distancing norms. It has the authority of a cop, a policeman. It is equipped with the image recognition. If you have ever uploaded your picture on internet, it can recognize you, who you are. So if you won't follow social distancing norms, it will issue you a ticket on the spot. It is solar chargeable, doesn't need any food, doesn't, it doesn't get tired, doesn't need any break. So during the pandemic, the best use, RoboDog by Boston Dynamics, no breaks, no food, it can work 24x7 and it can enforce social distancing. So till now we've been talking about robots or human beings. How about if I let you know on your screen, you're seeing a human being, but she's a robot, yes. Humanoid. I got a chance last year in February to come across her. She talks like us. She walks like us. She even depicts, um, you know, emotions like us. She's officially the citizen of UAE. And she recently even uh, took part in a fashion show. She can even throw sarcasm like us, but she's a humanoid. So in the real future, the days are not far away when we would be walking with fellow humans. 
and we wouldn't be sure whether they are humans or humanoids. So the time is coming. So I know we are already running late on the time. So that's it. Thank you from my side. Any question answers, you can note down my personal information and you can reach out to me. You can Google Munish Chandal. Anything you feel like you want to ask me, please reach to me. Thank you so much. Namaste from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Manish. And whoa, you have taken us to a very different world. And I guess now today we are accepting this new normal. Maybe a few years down the line, we may be sitting with a humanoid around, maybe your clone around, and we'll be having a good interaction over it. Thank you so much for this wonderful session. I think we'll be having certain questions which will be there in the chat box. Any question, audience? You can place the question in the chat box. Thank you so much, Dr. Shikha, for your kind words. And um, Shikha, ma'am, how are you sure that I'm a human? It could be possible that uh, Dr. Jindal would have cloned me and I'm his humanoid talking to you and delivering the keynote. That could be a possibility. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nidhi. <laughs> so if any questions you can take up, otherwise they can reach out to me and you can move on with the conference. Uh, so that is a question. Yes. Samya, please place a question. Am I Samya, audible? Can, yeah, you're audible, Samya. You can ask the question. Hello, hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to the conference. And I'm really uh, glad that I got the opportunity to ask you the question, sir. My question is that uh, you did mention it while explaining the video, but I would like to know a little more about what is your take on the employment opportunities, talking about the AI, uh, and especially in countries like developing countries in India. Wonderful. So, what so, that's a wonderful question and I'm sure many more would want to know about it. So I would really love to say that, yes, we have a human notion that AI, when, when it would make autonomous processes, it would eat up jobs, it would uh, destroy the opportunities. But as of now, when I'm speaking to you, there are 52 million opportunities. Remember the number, 52 million opportunities waiting only in the sphere of AI itself. Okay, now second thing, who is making this AI? Us. We are the ones who are making AI happen, right? Artificial intelligence. So the only thing we need to do is update ourselves. Learn to learn, continuously learn, unlearn to learn. The world we are getting towards the new norms, we have to give away the old norms, learn. So all we have to prioritize is our own development. I have a very elaborative session next time if, uh, when we get a chance in gyms. This session, I will take up a one and a half hour to two hour session whereby you will get to know each and everything about AI, that how it uh, provides opportunities. But we are the ones who are developing these technologies. So the only thing now required is we need to update ourselves so that we can develop the technologies and we should be able to operate these robots. Who are going to operate the robots? Us. So the only thing required is, so take, take an example, whatever man, manpower we have in our factory or in our manufacturing unit, we just need to update, upgrade them so that they, they are able to operate autonomous machineries. They are able to operate autonomous processes. So this is the only thing required is we need to update ourselves. Otherwise, there are tons and tons of opportunities av available and more opportunities are going to come. Who, are, who is going to make them? Who is going to innovate? Who is going to create? Who is going to produce? Who is going to code? Who is going to operate? Us only. This is us. So all we need to do is innovate. Like the way uh, I told you, I'm the pioneer of e-mobility. When I launched, I faced my hiccups. I had my fair share of struggles. But now we are number one in India and we are featured among top five in the world. And we are the only manufacturer of that in the entire Indian peninsula. So all it needs is the willpower, determination at your end and keep upgrading yourself. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this wonderful question. Moving on to the next question. Abhin Mudgal. Can you please unmute yourself and you can ask the question? Um, so, thank you for... Thank you. Um, I guess it's my turn only. So thank you for recognizing yes. me, ma'am. So the only question I have for you, sir, is that um, it's, it's a question that has been um, on my mind since about um, the 2016 elections that happened in America. So the question in my mind is how the usage of AI can help us in living conveniently and leisurely in a pandemic-like situation, taking the example of the current one, right? But with the fact being that Google Home and Amazon's Alexa 
I'm taking these as examples. Mm-hmm. Saves input data from the consumer, mm-hmm. you know, to achieve that convenience level that has been that has been presented to us, right? Mm-hmm. But it has been accused multiple times of privacy breaches. Well, yes. So, I mean, how should we go about this situation? So, should we be worried or should we be relieved? Yes. See, a uh, wonderful question again, Abhin. So, yes, privacy laws, as you know, that uh, the law system on paper in India, we have the strongest one. But when it comes to practice, we lag behind, I think, most of the countries in the world. So the only thing when you're talking about privacy, so I really want to let you know one thing. When your Google Home or when your Alexa is plugged in, doesn't matter even if you're not using it, it is continuously recording everything that you talk at home. Whatever, even if you're discussing, even if you're asking your mom about a cup of tea, or even if you're talking about a brand or your favorite color cause, everything is data intensive. They want to know every data about Abhin, what is his favorite color, what does he drink, what kind of tea he drinks, what does he eat, what does he wear, whatever you're discussing, even if you're planning to buy a new car, so that they can feed that information to relevant, uh, you know, companies, and they can sell those products to you. So now when it comes to privacy, you have to be a watchdog for yourself. See that your Alexa and Google Homes are not plugged in all the time. One. Second, upload the only relevant information on maybe Facebook, Instagram. These days I'm seeing youth, they even if they are eating something, even if they get up, even good morning, everything goes online. So if you are so worried about your privacy, you have to know what should be going online. If you go on my Facebook, you will only see my social life. You won't get to know about my personal life at all, what I'm doing in my personal life. So that is how you have to be your own watchdog when it comes to privacy. Yes, privacy is a big issue in the data intensive world, in the AI driven world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be taking just one more last question as running late. So Vidushi, you can ask the question. I would like to thank you, sir, for giving such a great insight of the AI. Uh, I would like to ask your perspective on the, how do you see the future of AI-driven products in the Indian context? Oh, wonderful. Uh, Vidushi, you talk in any context, and especially in Indian context, AI is already everywhere in our life. If you had gone through my presentation, whatever I showed, that already exists. That is the real world. I haven't shown you any concept video. This is, that is the real world I've showcased to you. And our life is more going to be AI driven. Yes, of course, it's going to take time if we compare it with the West. But our each and every sphere, like take an example, Apple Watch. When we wear a watch, it is taking note of our, it is even capable of doing eco. So it is taking all our vitals. And whether or I don't know whether you know or, uh, you know this or not, it is all getting recorded on uh, Apple servers. So our life is going to be so data intensive. People are already using Alexas, Googles, and already self-driving cars are going to be coming to India and Tesla. Obviously, Indian government is not going to permit them, but it would have those capabilities. So whatever sphere of our life you talk about, it is going to be AI-driven. Now it all depends upon us how we want to use those processes. The very first slide when I showcased you your pizza ordering process, that is the real life I'm telling you. And that is happening to us. They have all our data. They have our favorite colors. They have our sizes, what kind of clothes we wear. And I don't know whether you know this, uh, Google was offering free unlimited space on Google servers for Google Photos. You know why? Earlier, the technology could only recognize who you are. Now the technology has gone so deep, it can even recognize what brands you wear, what colors you wear, who your friends are, who you hang out with, even the poster behind your wall. They can even take a note of that as well. So to- technology has gone so intensive that it is all data driven. So that is why I'm saying only your relevant information should go online. Thank you, Vidushan. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, students, for these questions. I ask, the other students can ask questions via email to Dr. Manish. Manish, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for sparing time for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm blessed and privileged. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Moving ahead. It always seems until it's done, says Nelson Mandela. We have with us our next guest, who is a TEDx speaker, talent coach and author from Belgium. And he is Ms. Luke Tools. He studied educational sciences and is a pioneer of talent-based thinking in Belgium and the Netherlands. His book called Go With Your Talent is being published for the 24th time and his ideas are widespread in the world of education and business. In addition, he's the author of Help My Batteries Are Draining, which is a book about burnout and was voted the best learning and development book in 2012. 
He's a fluent speaker who always touches the audience and gets them thinking. He's all talent whisperer and a talent and burnout coach. Besides writing new publications, he spends a lot of time presenting lectures about talent and burnout at home and abroad. In addition, he has worked with partners to develop the online tool mytalentbuilder.com, which is used in many large organizations in Belgium and the Netherlands. Furthermore, he is jointly responsible for establishing a network of child talent whisperers, the professionals who teach people to have talent-related discussion with children so that they can organize such discussion free of charge annually in the society or surroundings. He will be talking about stress management, well-being, and new HR practices. Thank you, Mr. Lou, for sparing time for us. We are pleased and honored to have you with us. I request Mr. Lou to please address the audience. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Luc. I live in Belgium. Um, and first, I would like to say I feel very much connected to many of my friends in Delhi. I've been several times in Delhi uh, to give workshops, to give lectures, but also to visit gyms and to give guest lectures at the uh, gyms. Also in the past months, I got the opportunity to give some uh, online courses uh, to gyms uh, and students of gyms. So uh, I feel very much connected to what's happening in your country in this moment. And we all in the world are uh, in the same situation that we try to, to go on with the situation we're in. I would also like to thank uh, gyms for organizing this excellent conference, uh, the excellent preparation you have done. So it's an honor for me to speak uh, today on the future uh, beyond COVID uh, from the perspective of stress and burnout and uh, talent. I will share my presentation. Um, yes. So what I would like to do is to tell a little bit about stress and burnout, about how it's uh, uh, how it's dealing, how we, are, we can deal with it uh, at this moment, uh, how, it, how we can deal with it in the, in the current period of COVID, but also post-COVID, how we can deal with it. And um, maybe to start, um, uh, I studied a lot of uh, positive psychology. And what I learned is that we are all on this, on, on this continuum all the time. And on the one side, uh, these are moments we are fueled with energy. Uh, we do our work. We love to do our work. Uh, we, are, we come home in the evening and we feel tired, but we are looking forward to the next day. We have a positive self-esteem and we feel seen, recognized by other people. But sometimes on the other side of the same continuum, we have moments that we have uh, low energy. Uh, we come home in the evening, we are tired and we don't look forward to the next day. Sometimes we feel exhausted. We develop a negative self-esteem. And in many cases, then we don't feel seen, recognized and appreciated. And the, the first part of the continuum for me is about how can we develop a talent perspective in helping people to, to do the jobs that are related to their talents. And on the other side, it's about how can we prevent stress and burnout. So in the second part, I would like to tell something about talent and talent development. First part, I would like to explain something about stress and burnout. So when it's about stress and burnout, maybe first I could introduce some, some concepts and the difference between uh, some of those concepts. First, what is a burnout? Well, a burnout is an energy disorder that has a relation with the workplace. That means we have a very low energy um, and the cause is in the working situation. And having a burnout, it has three symptoms. And the first symptom, it's about having very low energy. It's about being tired, but it's also about feeling you're not able to take responsibility. You're not able to take up leadership. You're not able to finish things in the way you would like to finish it. So you're very tired um, and you feel your possibilities are restricted. Um, and sometimes you, you even feel guilty about the fact you don't have the energy to perform as you would like to perform. The second one is about doubting one's competencies. People in a burnout, it's like there's something between their head and their belly, they, they can't connect anymore with, towards the questions, who am I? What do I want to do in life? Uh, what's my mission? Who, uh, what are my skills? What are my possibilities? So we don't know it anymore. So we don't know anymore uh, who we are, what we want, 
I mean, it's very difficult to, to connect to future ideas about uh, or development in the future. And the third symptom of a burnout, it's about, um, it's, it's about um, dealing other people in an impersonal way. It's about being in your head. It's about being much more disconnected with other people. It's about behaving different. Uh, people say there's something with you, I can't define what, but you, you, it's like we can't connect with you uh, the, last, uh, the last months and the last weeks. So there's, there's like a distance between you and other people. The central dynamic of a burnout is all about having lost your autonomy. It's like other people are determining your life. Like other people have the steering wheel of your life in their hands. You lost your autonomy. The good news about the burnout is it can be coached. As it, about, as, as, it is, as it is about the lack of autonomy, you can be coached to get again the steering wheel of your life in own hands. The second concept is the concept of, of a depression. A depression is not an energy disorder, but it's a mood disorder. And it's a mood disorder that is not related only to work, but it's a mood disorder that is related to the whole life. It's like there's a big wall between you and the future. It's like you have no future uh, at all. It's like you have no perspective uh, on, on the future. And people with a depression, they feel very bad. They have uh, a lot of negative thoughts, even sometimes doubting about, do I want to live further in this world? As a burnout can be coached, a depression can't be coached. A depression is much more a sickness. Um, and that means when you have a depression, you need doctors, psych psychiatrists, um, you need medication. Um, and it's much more a long-term guidance you need in order to get out uh, of a depression. So that means giving advices to people with a depression, think positive and so on, it won't help them. The third um, concept is about exhaustion. And exhaustion is being very, very tired. And during this COVID crisis, we all went through that tiredness. It's about being so tired that you feel you need a lot of rest. And when you, when you are exhausted, it means you can recover by resting and a lot. And if you want to know the difference between exhaustion and burnout, well, typically for exhaustion is you don't sense, you don't doubt the sense of your work. You have no questions about the future. It's just in the moment you feel very, very tired and exhausted. And that means resting, uh, taking some time for yourself is a, is a good way in order to get out of that exhaustion. And the fourth concept is stress. Stress is about the physical tension in your body that is the result of expectations you can't meet or you are not willing to meet. So for instance, it's weekend, it's Friday, and you have a, a meeting with friends in the evening. And at the moment you, um, you want to go to the, to, to, to the meeting with your friends, you can get a phone from work and they say, there's something you have to finish it and you have to finish it this evening before 10 o'clock. And then you have that tension in yourself because if you say no, to, your, uh, to the question to finish something for the work, you will have stress about having not uh, being able to, to meet that expectation. Uh, at the moment you say yes to that expectation, you will have stress because you, you, can't, you can't meet the expectation of your friends to be with your friends. And of course, me having such a situation, once a time, it's not a problem at all. But imagine every day of the week, you have that kind of a dilemma expectations you're not able to meet or you're not willing to meet those expectations that could create a kind of a chronic stress and that chronic stress could bring you in a burnout at a certain time as mentioned i've written a book on burnout in belgium as i have a, a, a lot of experience in organizations as a, as a consultant and od consultant and what what we discovered is that there are two two dynamics that are at the basis of a burnout and the first dynamic we have called loyal to everyone except to yourself and your health. And in this first dynamic, we see people uh, that have most, mostly those three talents or characteristics. And the first one, they have the talent of a busy bee. They always want to be busy 
in a meaningful way from morning till evening. If they have done a lot during a day, they're happy. If they weren't able to do a lot, they feel bad. When they're in a meeting and it's really going about nothing, they think about all those things they could have done during the meeting. I'm always busy also in the evening uh, at home uh, and the weekend. And it's a very beautiful talent because a lot, of, um, a lot of employers want people with the talent of a busy bee. But people with this talent of busy bee, they go beyond their limits under stress. That means under stress, they work harder and harder and harder. And they, does, they don't listen to the signals of their body that they should take rest. A second characteristic of people that tend to, to, to become in this, in this dynamic is the error ego. They aspire impec impeccable work. People with the talent of error ego, when they get an email and there's a mistake in it, I have seen it within two seconds. And they love to finish work in a way it's for 100% good and right. But also people with this talent, they tend to go beyond their limits because imagine, it's six o'clock in the evening and you, 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 you tend to close your laptop and to stop working, but then you see that email. And in that email, it's mentioned that there's still a mistake that should be solved. People with this talent, they will choose to open the laptop again to solve the problem, even if they have to work two hours later because uh, having the stress in the evening of an unsolved problem, they can't bear it. You can imagine if you have every evening such a mail coming in at the moment you wanted to stop working, um, it, you could become exhausted. And the third characteristic of people um, um, uh, in this dynamic uh, is that these people have the talent of yes trooper. And that means if anyone who is important for you asks you a question, you tend to say yes. And if you say yes, you will do whatever needed and possible in order to make uh, this happen so that you can do what the other one has asked you. You can imagine also that if you do this too much, if it's very difficult to say no, um, it will be difficult also. And also here you can go be beyond your limits. But no, if you imagine to have those three talents together in yourself as a person, that means that those three characteristics will, will tend in a combination uh, to, to have the risk for you to go beyond your limits, the more and the more and the more and the more. And the big problem with people that have those three characteristics is that uh, the, the, the body gives signals, you should take rest, but they don't listen to the signals of the body. And at a certain moment, in a very dramatic uh, way, the body says, no, it's done. And that means you try to get up in the morning, you can't get up, you get emotional, um, you, you can't sleep anymore, you feel anxious, and so on, and so on. And that means in this dynamic, you lost the autonomy because your life is determined by everything that is expected by you, by the work you have to do, the mistakes you have to solve. And that means you have no choice anymore to make choices because you have to work too hard and you never get it done. So people who um, are in this dynamic, of course, they will have to, to, uh, to rest to recover, but the most, most important for people in this dynamic will be to take again in their hands the steering wheel or the, of their life and to make choices, to make choices, uh, to do things not anymore, to do those things more. Um, and as long as they don't make those decisions, uh, the energy loss will uh, persist. The second dynamic is a relational dynamic. And it's a relational dynamic and it happens the most with the most motivated people, people that are uh, very much driven, that have a very high intrinsic motivation. Um, they have the risk to become in this dynamic. And it's, uh, we have described it in the book in, uh, in different phases, but what happens is that you, you're working very hard, you're very busy, um, you're very driven, you're very enthusiastic, and at a cert certain moment, something happens totally unexpected. So for instance, you get another manager, and he, he deals with you in a totally different way. You have a new colleague, you have to collaborate with that new colleague and you feel there's a lot of tension from the first day. You have applied for a project uh, or a job and you're absolutely sure you will get it. And then you hear the feedback, you don't get the job. And then you think this is not possible. And what's happening in this dynamic is that you, you feel totally not recognized by someone else in your workplace and you don't accept it. And so being home in the evening, 
the whole evening you're only and only thinking about the situation at the work and you become angry at the moment you think about this situation and you start to to build arguments to 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 build uh, 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 words that you can use the next day to convince the other one that he should change that he should have another view and the next day you try to say this and then the and the, uh, and you try to to convince the other one he's wrong but it doesn't work and you get feedback in a very negative way and that means the more and the more you are thinking all the all the all the weekend all the evening about that person that doesn't um, um, sees you as a person you want to be seen and this is a very uh, uh, dangerous dynamic because also here you lose your autonomy because there's someone else in the world that has the steering wheel of your life in his or her hands. If he doesn't change, if she doesn't change, you can't go further. Your career is stopped. And um, in psychology and in philosophy, you have the philosopher Hegel, uh, but you also have the uh, uh, psych psychologue uh, Lacan, uh, psychoanalysis. And um, um, they talk about the fight between the slave and the master. Yeah. And the slave and the master are fighting because um, the slave is fighting against the injustice that is done to him by the master. But the big problem in this dynamic is the more the slave fights the master, the more the slave proves that he is a slave. So that means that in the fighting against the other one, um, you will see that the more you fight, the, the longer the burnout will take. And so what we help people, what we guide people in is to step out of the fight. And sometimes it is by looking for another job, for looking for another position. Um, sometimes it's about having a good and a deep conversation with that other person. Um, but sometimes it's very difficult for people when they stay in this fight and they don't get out of this fight, they uh, stay sick. So um, these are the two dynamics that are related uh, with burnout. But what I believe in a post-COVID uh, uh, era, I think it will be much more important that we all choose together to much more invest in our own talent and in, uh, in companies that allow people to work from their talents in order to build the resilience of people over a long time. And when it's about talent, most of the people think talent is about being excellent in a certain activity. It's about being the best in a certain activity, like a, a top singer or musician or soccer player um, or manager. But that's not my definition of talent. For me, talent is not about being the best in a certain activity, but it's about what activities does with you. And so for me, talent is about any activity in your life that goes totally at ease and that satisfies you. Um, sometimes your talent, of course, is difficult, is going difficult. But when it's about the talent, you experience those moments of effortlessness at, you, at the moment you are doing it. You're coaching someone, you're giving a presentation, you're in a meeting, you're in a discussion, and every part of you is involved in the situation. At a certain moment, you, you look your watch and you say, it's already so late. Um, I didn't know it was already so late. And you sit down at a chair and then you, you, you know, uh, you feel tired, but as at the moment uh, you're in, the f in, in that situation of flow, uh, you don't experience tiredness. And my, my definition of talent has four layers. The first layer is it's about activities that are going effortless and that satisfy you. The second one is talent is about activities that make time fly. And that's flow. Flow is a concept of uh, Csikszentmihalyi. That's one of the founders of positive psychology. And it's very nice to see and to understand that flow is a very, very important part of our life. You know, about 20% of the people on this planet experiences everyday flow. About 20% of the people on this planet never experience flow. But flow is something very important because when you're in flow, it's like you're working hard at the same moment and at the same time you feel relaxed. For instance, when you're coaching, it's like you forget the rest of the world. You forget your problems. You're coaching with the coachee. Um, and at the same time, you're working hard. And at the same time, 
you, you become relaxed in that kind of a situation. I believe that if we can build organizations in which people experience flow a lot of time, it will be uh, organizations that have happy employees. It's so important. The third layer of my definition is talent is about activities that load your batteries. Research shows that when people can work based on their talents in work, it has a, a double impact. And the first impact is people who have positive emotions in the moment. And if you have been working based on, on your talents, if you feel positive emotions in the, in, in the moment, you will be able to perform complex tasks at a much higher level with much better results. Because when you feel, when you have positive emotions, you will invest much more out of yourself into the task and into the challenge. And the second impact of positive emotions is that people who have been able to do work based on their talents and that see result as a result as a, as a result of the work they have done, they build resilience, they build, uh, uh, they build resources, uh, physical resources, uh, social resources, communicative, communicative resources that help them to even in uh, months or years later uh, to be strong, to have much more resilience in dealing with problematic situations. So that means that companies that invest in the possibility for the employees to work based on their talents, they invest in the resilience. And last the layer is talents about activities that help you to become your authentic self. You just do your thing while working. You're not thinking, am I allowed to say this? Am I allowed to do this? You just, just do your thing. And uh, that means you can be yourself while working. I dream of companies where time is flying all the time uh, as much uh, as possible. So what we have done is we have um, um, uh, we, we made a concept, it's talent in action. And that means if you have such talents that, that make time fly, and if you're able to develop skills and behavior with those talents, and if you have, are able to find a context that is connected with your intrinsic motivation, then at that moment, you have people that do excellent work that can be very, very good in, in work. And at the same time, have that experience that time is flying that their batteries are loaded while they're working. We have developed uh, 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 an online tool. It's my talent builder. And in that we have defined about 39 talents. And if you those, discover those talents, and if you uh, work with the tool, it helps you to discover your talents, but also it, it helps you to look for workplaces in which you can use those talents, or you can invite your employees to, to work with this tool in such a way that helps them to discover much more how they can do the work based on their talents. So um, one, of the, one of the talents, for instance, is the, is the novelty seeker. It's in the blue category. Um, and people with the talent of novelty seeker, uh, when it's song about a new project, a new, new tool, a new project, uh, it's, it's fun for them. And they will learn much, much, uh, with a much higher speed. They will learn new things. Uh, they will inspired by, by the new, but at the moment the new is going away, they need something new again. And so that means that variety in the work is very important for your employees with the talent of novelty seeker. People with the talent of mood reader, that's in the red category, are people that when they're, when they're coming into a room and there was just a conflict five minutes ago, they have felt immediately. They see at one movement in the face of someone that, that a remark was not, was not appreciated. And they will do small things in, other, in a way other people will, um, um, will, will feel better after that. So they're very empathic and they feel with their body whatever they need to be very good in working with people. Another talent in the, in the green is, uh, for instance, the inspiring captain. People with the talent of inspiring captain, when they're convinced about a certain ID, um, then they will, they will start to inspire, to motivate, uh, other people to go with, with them in the direction of the things they believe in. It's a very beautiful talent. And for people with the talent of uh, insp inspiring captain, trust and collaboration is very important. The source of unique ideas in the orange domain is about people that when they hear or see or read ideas, they become very enthusiastic and they will start to make connections in their head between things other people would, wouldn't make connections they, they recombine it into a new ID. They get very enthusiastic about it. 
and they want to start to do it and to talk about it immediately. Very beautiful talent of people that need a lot of autonomy. They need much more autonomy of other people. And when they get autonomy, they will perform at a very high level. And for instance, then a last talent is a talent of knowledge sponge uh, at the left, at the bottom. People with the talent of knowledge sponge, you recognize them because many of them, they read or they process information before going to sleep. They love new information. And that means when they're reading a book, a text, or looking for something on the internet, at the moment they, they, they process the information, it fuels them with energy. And at the moment they feel stressed and they start to read a book, they become relaxed. And they read before, before sleeping, because when they do that, the head is filled with, inform with information, they can disconnect from the day and they fall asleep. So what we have done is we made this, uh, this tool, my talent builder, and it's used by these large companies you all might know. Uh, for instance, Johnson & Johnson, the company in Belgium that makes the vaccines, they all use the, the talent builder as a tool in order to help people to discover their own talents. And the company uh, in this way tries to make a company in which people work hard, have great, great results, and, um, but also um, in a way they feel happy and they fuel their batteries. They, get, they are tired in the evening, but they are looking forward to the next day. Uh, so people who would like to have a free access code to try out um, uh, this tool, send me an email. The email is here at the bottom. Um, and if you want, you can uh, uh, send me an email and then I'll give you an access code so we can try out uh, this, uh, this online uh, tool. Um, to finish um, this, um, first, uh, this is Marty Seligman. He's the founder of Positive Psychology. And uh, Positive Psychology has been founded around 2000. And I think uh, in the post-COVID period, this will be much more important, much more important that we build companies that help people at the same time to be happy in what they're doing, to be satisfied, but at the same time also have high results and perform at a very high level. And what he has uh, done, he made a model with five elements and he says, and it's proven, it's evidence-based. If you invest in those elements, you get companies with happy people and high results. And it's about positive emotions. It's about people that feel good while working. And feel good, it's not about drinking a Coke. Feel good, it's about, the, about doing activities also that make you happy in what you're doing and seeing the impact of what you're doing. It's about engagement, it's about finding flow, it's about the time flying. When time flies in a company, you have people that are highly motivated and that perform at a high level. It's about having authentic relationships, about people that care about you, but you also caring about them. It's about getting feedback, giving feedback. It's about having good conversations. It's about meaning. It's about doing things in life that are related to your values and doing things in which that give you the, the, the feeling that you really contribute in a, in a powerful way to other people. And of course, it's about achievements. When you see, when you realize achievements, uh, when, you have, when you see results, also this helps you to feel better at the one side and at the other side um, um, to, to, of course, deliver great results in the company. So um, to finish also with this, um, uh, there has been a lot of recent research about that flow. And uh, at this moment, I'm, uh, I'm making an instrument to measure flow in companies. With some large companies in Belgium, we are experimenting. Because when you're in flow, when the time is flying, what you see is that the stress hormone cortisol is, is there at the, at, the, at the very ideal level in your body. You produce dop dopamines. Uh, that's a hormone of happiness. People who experience time flying, they, they produce those dopamines. What you see when people are in, in, in flow is that both the, uh, the non-sympathetic and the, the, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system is in an ideal balance. And it is, like I explained earlier, that means that when you're in flow, at the same time, you're relaxed. And at the same time, you're working hard. People who are in flow, they have much, deep, much more deep briefing, heart coherence. And that means that if you build companies post-COVID that, that invest in work and invest in talent development of people, they invest in much better, better performance and happiness of their people. And I think this is, a, for me, a very, very big challenge towards uh, the future. So um, this is what I um, wanted to share with you.
Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Tools. Thank you very much for enlightening us and giving us a different perspective towards stress and being burnout. Because as humans, we tend to always be a perfect person at the workplace or at our home. And we, we forgot that we generally stress ourselves doing that. So thank you so much for enlightening us on that. Uh, moving on, we have certain questions from our students. Uh, so can I ask Umama to ask the first question to Mr. Luke? Hello, sir. It was in, uh, indeed very enlightening session. The speech was very good. I just realized that I, I have a busy bee character. I just realized that after reading. Um, so my question is that what are your intakes regarding work from home? Do you think it is sustainable in the future? Well, I would like to answer. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, also, people that are busy can find ways um, to disconnect uh, from work. People that are have the talent of a busy bee, for instance, like you maybe uh, could have, uh, they love to be busy. But what I always say to people, if uh, look, from, look for activities that are disconnected from your work, other kinds of activities that when you do them at home, they involve you for 100% at the moment you're busy with it. It could be talking with your best friends, um, it could be uh, being involved in setting up a certain activity in your community. It's also being busy, but it's also it's being busy with something that has no connection with your work. And so for me, every hour that you're involved in activities outside of the work that have a that need 100% focus, these are the golden hours. And so that means if you work at home, uh, while you also work at work at, at the same time, so you can't work at home. For me, check your emails, it's not a problem. Using your smartphone is not a problem as long as you have those golden hours in the evening and in the weekend that you do other activities that involve all of your attention and that, of course, are useful and that have sense. Thank you so much for this. Uh, moving on to the next question, Cynthia. Cynthia, can you please unmute yourself and ask a question to Mr. Lug if you have any? Cynthia, am I audible to you? I think we have a question from Rishel Puri. Rishel, can you please unmute yourself? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, you're audible, Rishel. People are finding work from home very hectic and challenging as they are also handling home affairs at the same time. What strategies would you recommend? Yeah, well, I think we will all be happy when this period is finished. And uh, for me, it's uh, also feel that exhaustion um, uh, at, when, when I have to give a lot of webinars at this moment. And it's all about this combination. Um, but I would like to repeat what I just answered. And I, I, it is about uh, find activities at home, uh, book them in your agenda. It can be about doing sport. It can be about uh, making a walk. It can be about uh, having a conversation with one of your best friends. It can be um, about cooking. Um, uh, really plan those activities that fuel you with energy. And it's different for every person what it is, but um, please do it. Because um, for instance, when you, when you do online work and the, the work you are doing and, uh, has a high impact, that means you're not in a meeting just listening to the other, other people, but you have to have high impact in that meeting it takes so much energy uh, and much more energy than live meetings do. And, uh, and then it's really important to, to, to look for those other activities um, and to, to know that even reading a book, uh, even when it's fiction, uh, uh, believe that it can really help you to fuel your batteries to invest in other activities. All right. Thank you so much for this wonderful answer. Thank we you, have one more, one more question from Smart Bagla. Smart, can you please unmute yourself? And this is the last question we are taking for the session. Yeah, ma'am. Mm -hmm. so firstly, good evening to one half present of you. So my question is, as employees are working in remote setting, how companies would evaluate their performance? Yes, 
Well, I, that's interesting because when you when you when you look to results from a from a talent perspective, it's all about output. It's all about all about results. It's not about how you do the work. It's about the output and the result of the work. So that means that if, when people work uh, from home, it's very important to contract on the results and the output of people and give people the freedom and the autonomy and how they work towards those results. And if you are able to, um, to, to realize output by doing it in a smart way and to work uh, three hours less than someone else, that's for me very fine. So I won't evaluate the way, the way you work and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the way you work during the day. I won't ask how much have you worked, but I'll ask you about the results. I ask you about the output. And if that is okay, I give you all the freedom to work at home uh, in a way you like it. All right, thank you. Um, so look, I would like to take this, this is a very important question that has popped out in my chat box, which says, how would you respond if your manager gave you negative feedback in front of your peers? How to handle that negative feedback? Well, it's very difficult. I can't give a lot of questions. It's all about find a way to, 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 to prevent yourself to be affected too much about this, uh, this, uh, this negative feedback. Uh, but post-COVID, for me, there's a big, big responsibility for leaders uh, to develop mm -hmm. uh, a coaching, uh, coaching style of leadership that they become aware of the impact of those remarks. Um, that there's, there's changing something in the fact that being, being a manager means you have the power uh, to determine how other people work. And of course, you're in a position that you have influence on, on the work of your people, but using power uh, in, the, in, the, in the interaction with people never helps people to be at their best. Um, mm -hmm. Use influence and not power. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much for sparing time for our students and audience. And we wishing you love for the new model that you are working on. So maybe next time we're going to meet, the model is completely ready for us. Thank you so thank very you. much. Thank you. I wish you a lot of success and thank you for this beautiful conference. Thank you. Thank you. All right, audience, uh, moving ahead. Business works only when you are close to the customer. Features don't sell. At the end of the day, the customer is going to ask, What's in it for me? Yes, this is the saying of our next speaker of this evening, Mr. Neeraj Walia, CEO at Mont Blanc India. With about 20 years in FMCG and luxury retail, he has carved his niche as a progressive and established executive to develop an executive growth strategy spanning startup business operations, establish a growing distribution network channel development, retail marketing operations, and delivering improved customer experience. He has matured with challenges and success with some of the finest organization, and it has always induced him to sharpen his skills and strengthen his will. Developed a strong organization from scratch, starting with three-member team, and scaled it to 240-plus distributors covering over 100 cities in India. Led and grew market share in the industry by adding competitive advantage. He will be throwing light on the topic, the changing consumer behavior during COVID times and its impact going forward. Sir, it's a matter of great pleasure to have you on this platform. The stage is all yours, though, virtually. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashika. I just want to do a, a quick check if my voice is clearly audible. Yes, you are audible, sir. Perfect. Thank you. First of all, my uh, uh, good afternoon and hello to everyone. Special thanks to uh, Professor uh, Dr. Dhar for organizing this session. Uh, a big hello to uh, all the esteemed guests over there. Uh, professors, and above all, I think this session is organized uh, for the pillars of our future, of uh, the pillars of our country, the students. So uh, what I would like to do is, yes, uh, thank you for this uh, beautiful uh, introductory note about myself, but I think uh, it, it's time for, for them to look around what's happening. It's always said there is no better place to learn than being at a point of sale or point of consumption, being closer to the customer. Who is the customer? You are the customer. Your families, people around, your neighbors, everyone is the customer and we learn from there. And when we have to learn what's happening around, so I thought, let me just take you through a small session of story. A story wherein what happened during this environment and how did we change according to it or adapted to it? 
I must also congratulate not just you all, but everyone who went through these challenging times that we adapted so well. Never ever we thought that we could be confined across into four walls. We started this journey where there was no light at the end of the tunnel, but we all adapted. So I think this goes for a big round of applause for everyone who is here, kids, adults, everyone who went through this. So it's a time of opportunity. And like it's always said, opportunity is never lost. If you are missing it out, somebody is ready to grab it. So I would encourage you all to take this time and opportunity. Before I start my presentation, look around. There are people who are professionals and during their professional course, they go forward and take the part-time MBA courses or the management courses because there's a paucity of time. They are currently pursuing their careers and they look around. Now you are there, you have time. Sharpen your skills. The first speaker, Dr. Jindal, also mentioned about artificial intelligence. There is so much about data. There is so much about consumer behavior. Your likings, Professor Luke talked about, find your passion. Find your passion, invest this time in that. So I think before going ahead, permit me to share my screen and uh, I'll try to take you through uh, a small journey. Is the screen audible? Uh, visible, sorry. Yes, sir, it is. Okay, perfect. So I just start uh, the session with uh, two quotes. The first one talked about, which I said, being challenged in life is inevitable, but being defeated is optional. And I'm dedicating this session to all the students over here. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Now going across, let's try and understand and uh, see how the behavior changed for uh, a normal consumer. So we have here, without giving any name, let's call him Mr. Indian. So there is Mr. Indian who was confined across at home and amidst the COVID scenario, let's give him a mask as well. So now this Mr. Indian, what is the environment he was facing? The environment he was facing was of the lockdown. Never ever he imagined that neither he can move out nor somebody else can move inside his house. So there was a fixed dilemma across. So what is it leading to? So anything which has to reach to me has to reach my doors. Anything, any services which require someone else to come to me has to kept on hold. For him, there is a fear. There is a fear of uncertainty. And amidst the fear of uncertainty, priorities prop up. The fear, fear of what is it all about? So what does fear lead to? Fear leads us to take precautionary measures. And this is all around in his mind. Then there is a tsunami of messages. Because we were not aware exactly of the situation, our WhatsApp groups, our social media groups, and every information platform is loaded with information and information, but nothing was authentic and clear. So there is an information overload about uncertainty for him. So imagine his psychological state of mind. But he's also, he's an individual, but then he's also a professional. So he's also been asked to work at home, a new environment where there are people around him. His, his, uh, there are pets at home, there are family members at home, kids demanding. There was a time he used to reach his office at 9 a.m. and leave at 6 p.m. And there is no one disturbing him. There is used to be his meeting room. But then there is this Mr. Indian who has been now forced to work in an environment ignoring the activities around. So it was a good of him, a positive thumbs up for him. We should not let go another very important member in his, in his house, in his family, in his life, which is who is Mrs. Indian. More challenging task for her. She was doing on one side, making home, cooking, managing kids. And in parallel, if she's a working professional, the life was quite tough for her. And that uh, gratitude goes for all the teachers as well, who were working throughout this pandemic and lockdown scenarios and making students uh, understand and work and ensuring that nothing stops. So this was a life environment for them. But there is this young, small little boy, life change for him as well. He used to have a school bus coming in the morning and in the evening, he used to have his uh, playgrounds and soccer classes and everything. Now he's facing with another a challenge out, 
that he has to learn how to log in, stay attentive, video on, anytime a question is asked, and he has to be digitally savvy. So look around, Mr. Ram or Mr. Indian, what is he facing? A complete lockdown, psych psychological mindset where there is fear all around. There is too much of information overload. In an environment, he has to perform his official, uh, the professional duties. Parallelly, look around for home as well. And then there is a kid at home. And amidst all of this, one thing which was looming around was the economic uncertainty. Many businesses were affected and some took the opportunity and move on. So there were a complete uh, a dynamics which were playing around, around this, uh, this never before seen scenario in everybody's life. Now, when he is at home, how does this entire thing change? How does it lead to his behavioral pattern change? What he used to do earlier, he was going across to a supermarket doing a shopping. It was a nearby big box supermarket or a grocery store. He used to shop from there. But because of the lockdown, many residential complexes had some small grocery stores or the Kirana stores. This drive to those big supermarkets was stopped. And what, what was the alternative? He went to the nearby grocery store. But when he went to the nearby grocery store, remember the background that he was, uh, there was a fear and fear of uncertainty, not just for him, for everyone around. So as a result of which, that led to panic buying. And what did it lead to? The empty shelves. We all have seen that. And when there is an empty shell, that reminds him, as a professional, the most important pillar across supply chain, availability in retail or in any business, availability becomes the key. Now, between all of this, when shelves were empty and he was looking around for an alternate, there was an opportunity across for private labels. And when there was an opportunity of private labels, it is now if you look around from private label perspective or an alternate brand perspective, we all know that India lived across on Amul butter. There was a time when Amul butter was not available on the shelves. So what is a closed based alternative? Are we going across for milky mist butter or we are going across for Britannia butter? These were the opportunities. Now, when these opportunities came, it's that the brands who where the supply chain is strong, the closed based alternate fits, fits the quality there is a shift across there. But then there was another opportunity for him. Along with private label, there were companies who were looking around to ensure that last mile delivery is made best. So there were new avenues, new go-to-market routes were discovered, whereby fruits or vegetables, or you call it bakery, they were delivered at the doors. Not just that, let me also tell you, that also gave, uh, there was, an, people found opportunity and there was this foodie buddy group. Like I was at home and there is a foodie buddy group and you want to uh, enjoy, let's say, um, uh, a prawns curry or anything. There is somebody in uh, 500 square meters of uh, your home and somebody is going to deliver that particular delicious cuisine back at your, at your doors. So this environment saw these entire changes and people were adapting to it. And look at it. Do you know now on Amazon in India, we have Amazon Fresh. In 2019, when I was talking to uh, the executives in uh, Amazon, they were doing a test run for Amazon Fresh. Can they deliver fruits, vegetables, and everything? And they started their test runs in Bangalore around mid of August 2019. And they just, this was just there. Look around for the private label or people who were available at the shelves. The cost of acquisition of the new customer went down dramatically. When this, all these things were happening, look around, what, how was his behavior earlier? He was earlier buying a product or ordering a product. When it used to get delivered, there was a payment on delivery. But then uh, let me just connect across another point before the payments and all. In his household, while uh, he, his wife and kids were there, but then another very important member, Kamwali Bai, the household help. And uh, everything was dependent on her, whether it is uh, brooming, whether it is uh, doing kitchen or cooking and everything. And suddenly, because of the lockdown, she was under also lockdown. So now what will happen? Who will do the household work? Now, on one side, Mrs. Indian is engaged across in managing kids, cooking. You need someone to manage the other aspects of, of uh, the house as well. That gave birth across. Suddenly, nobody imagined that 
dishwashers will start selling in. So opportunity was there. I remember around in July last year, the CEO of Bosch made a statement that he has 20,000 dishwashers order pending with him. So it was not just people saw a sudden rise across in dishwasher sales. There was also a time when vacuum cleaners made the inroads. Why? Convenience was the key. When we were in need of uh, a household help, household help was available. But when you, have, you were challenged across because of the situation, you needed convenience. People did not look at the cost then because the important thing was the convenience and, and they suddenly saw a sudden rise across of household appliances in. In parallel, yeah, now coming back across on the payments. In uh, India, has, India in past, most of the uh, payments were done on delivery or there used to be a credit facility and all. It all shifted. Everything was prepaid. You pay and you get it delivered. You pay, your order will be delivered. Even if you pay, still you have to wait for some more time to come. So this was a shift which was getting transitioned across. And even on the prepaid model, look at it. Everybody was going digital. People were looking for contactless payments. When you were going, even uh, the smaller grocery stores, wherever they were open, there was a fear in the mind when I'm giving my credit card across to swipe, will credit card be also infected? Do I need to sanitize my credit card as well? So barring all those things, most of the businesses moved across on contact. <laughs> Who had never gone into this particular channel started moving much faster into this particular thing. This was a boon for the businesses as well who moved from cash only to contactless pay. I know about most of the vegetable vendors and people, sorry, all those people moved across to the contact moment. So this was a big shift out over there. Then, along with that, we all saw, and this was uh, happening, we were unbundling because we were buying on e commerce. So shopping carts got unbundled and these started because of the panic and the fear. What did it lead to? Buying more, buying more and they were cartons. Every home suddenly started having a space which was dedicated across to store next three or four weeks essentials or groceries. It's common across in European and uh, American markets that you have uh, a big deep freezers, you buy frozen stuff and keep it and there are separate storerooms. But Indian houses, because uh, the grocery store or what we call mom and pop shop or a kirana shop is just at arm's length. But suddenly we started buying because there was uncertainty about the supply chain. When will there be a curve across on non-essentials or essentials? So that led to a sudden buildup across on Amazons. Now, how will it lead to a change in behavior in times to come? We'll discuss that as well. There was a sudden demand of tablets. Everything was going digital. Mr. Indian, Mrs. Indian. Uh, master Indian, everyone was looking around to get connected. There were Zoom classes. Every, now everybody need a gadget to work on. In fact, uh, there was a statement from Flipkart that this, they saw spurt in sales on these uh, tabs and gadgets from smaller towns like Medinipur, or you talk about Muzaffar Nagar or Bhagalpur. Now imagine this is now when they are using tabs because of a necessity now, what will the tabs be put to use six months down the line or three months down the line when situations ease out? So there is an inroad of digital uh, space, digital communication in their lives, even in smaller towns. So India awaits. There was a time when somebody used to say India has a 1.35 billion population. And uh, I used to take it as India has 1.35 billion opportunities, the way you look at it. When these tabs and everything were going around, now you are working, you have a house environment, you have professional life, and uh, you need a personal time as well. But when everything was on standstill, creation of media was also hampered. Most of the soap operas or uh, the channels were on a standstill except news channels because the content creation was stopped. So what was left out for us? Revisiting back the Ramayanas and Mahabharat episodes across, which were done across in 80s and 90s, but um, is Mr. Indian ready for that or a master Indian ready for that? That gave birth to the OTT channels. There was a new platform wherein you can not, not just get entertained, but for the advertisers to look around. 
Now for advertising, advertising suddenly stopped or dropped. Who are the people who are advertising or putting across money on this? People who were having their last miles ready and being not affected. They were the ones who were going ahead on this. But look around it. When you are ordering, you're ordering online. When you are paying, you're paying online. When you are uh, doing professional work, it was online. And when there was a shopping or entertainment, everything was happening online. So therefore, what was the next big, next big area for Mr. Indian to attend across to? And that was a very common sight, no internet. Therefore, people who were ready for the customers in the beginning, whether it was a copper fibers or the fiber optics, people who had broadbands very well established, they all were in. People who were doing, they, wherever there was an extent, nobody would have imagined that you need a, a UPS sort of a battery backup for your routers as well. Extenders, these all were in demand. So look around how these things changed across uh, in the life of Mr. Indian. Now, this is Mr. Indian when he was uh, at home attending to various types of changes which were happening around. Him. Then what happened? He's a professional as well, and he needs to manage his teams. Now, bigger challenge is, like he is under fear, his team is also under fear. What, will he, what should he do to ensure his team is intact? How product, like I shared with you that uh, you have an opportunity to enhance your skills, whether it is Google AdWords and all. Similarly, he has to ensure that this time is productively spent. <coughs> Sorry, the team is motivated and they engage well during these times. His supply chain is under stress. There was some time, some or the other supplier is not able to do the last mile. And therefore, his attention is on the last mile deliveries as well. And amongst all this, when I said economic uncertainty, there was a big question mark and every company had preserve your cash. The only thing, whenever the times are tough, we are taught is hold your cash. Don't do unnecessary spends. So that was the attention for the companies as well. So you start all the projects, all the new initiatives were kept on hold because that the only mantra in the companies was cash is king. And you know why in uncertainties, hold yourself well. Then when all these things were going on, this is his, his team, supply chain, cash. The only thing which could save him a little bit was generation of cash. How can you make it happen? Now, generation of cash, when your boutiques are under tight control or your shops are under tight control, the only thing which everyone think, only thing which comes to the mind for everyone is CRM. Well, what is CRM? Uh, yes, it is customer, customer relationship management, but not many people actually have gone into the details across of really managing and knowing their customer well. The essence of genuine customer management is perhaps a... Uh, very, very, only very few organizations are managing this uh, customer relationships well. But even if they had a customer data ready with them, they had a base of customer data ready with them. For Mr. Indian, the bigger challenge was how will he reach to the customer? How will he manage the last mile delivery? But he, now he is a he was a customer just two slides back. Now he's a professional who is going to uh, meet the customer or make, make the connect across with the customer. When he is having fear in his mind, the customer is also having fear in his mind. So the first and the foremost thing during this time for a professional was to attend to that fear, to ensure that we take safety seriously. You would have seen the advertisements coming across from airlines. Uh, there's a beautiful airlines from the Tata Group as well, Vistara, or the airports, whether it's Bangalore airport or the Delhi airport, they're announcing that how they are putting up the sanitizing, uh, the sanitizer tunnels, for all the, uh, uh, the trolleys which you use for your luggage and all, there were many, many measures which were taken, the contactless uh, boarding, uh, boardings and all those things. So the most important message to the consumer in these times was attending to his problem. And his problem was the fear, the fear of uncertainty around his security. So you attended to that, you made the first entry. And then now, remember, Mr. Indian was not able to move out of his house. So you need to find way to go closer to him. So what do you do? You find alternate go-to-market routes. You first convince him that your health is important for me, and then I will find a solution across and come closer across to you. Between all of this, 
when all these changes and things were happening, the important question came in. This was a testing time for every company to do an introspection and come to know, do you really know your customers? Are you genuine across and knowing your customers? How well you know your customers? Is it as good as just sending a WhatsApp or a text message and uh, announcing an offer? Are we doing anything beyond that? When it comes to knowing your customers, how great it is. Imagine you're walking inside a restaurant and someone tells you, hey, good afternoon, Dr. Dhar. It's so such a pleasure to welcome you back across into our restaurant. That is, and at times, yes, artificial intelligence is important, but then the personal touch, the genuine approach is very important. So let me just briefly take you through what is the customer relationship? What is CRM all about? So when we talk about CRM, the most important essence of CRM is not data, relevant data. At times, we just look at data, data, and data, but it's very important for us to identify what is in it for me. What is the data I need to understand? Each data is important, but not for everyone. Pick and choose the relevant data. Be genuine in getting that data which you require. Then the most important thing comes in analysis, data analysis. What you want to drive. At times, data can surprise you with beautiful insights. At times, you know what you want from the data, and data can give you some points. And then plan your actions across from that analysis. And the last one is uh, put your plan and pl put your plan into the action. In all CRM activities, I would again and uh, repeatedly and again and again emphasize it's very important to have a genuine customer relationship. Don't do it for the sake of just doing and getting and collecting and data. It's important for us to make customer feel belong. It's a journey. We need to take the, we need to take the first step and take the client or take the customer, walk the path which we want. So therefore, it has to be very, very uh, carefully, meticulously done. Now, with all these scenarios, uh, well, this picture talks about like we are coming out of the tunnel. So uh, we know these times are not going to last. This too shall pass and we are going to be out. But during these times, what did Mr. Indian do? Mr. Indian, he faced a situation where he adapted phenomenally well. Kudos to him. He understood to do multitasking. He understood not to be over dependent on anything. So he had his gadgets, whether it is the, uh, he got the gadgets at home, whether it is the vacuum cleaners or the dishwashers and he was doing multitasking and uh, he knew that he can keep he can rely on few sources. He tried and tested some things as well. And here, one thing again came back into the mind. Discount is not always important. Availability overrides that factor. Once the availability is restored, the first and the foremost thing for him was not at what price I'm getting. The first and the foremost thing was, am I getting this thing now at my convenience? Teams, everybody realized that even professionally, when we were sitting across at different points, you don't need to be physically at a place to do a thing. You can do it from anywhere, anytime, at any device. The entire scenario changed. Look at it, we always, uh, uh, just before March 2020, we always used to say the pollution index of, India, of Delhi, the pollution index, the pollution air, it was severe, poor, unacceptable, critical, we all saw if we want, we definitely will be able to deliver that. There were pictures which were shared wherein people in UP or people in uh, Uttarakhand were clicking that from my house. Now for the first time, Himalayas are visible. All those things were there. That gives us a learning. Nature, nature takes its course, but you need to have hand across over there. We suddenly saw when all these things happen, the the um, instant use or the plastics, they all went down. The consumption of all of that came down. There is no statistical study on that, but I can show you that this must be the case because we all have been a contributor across here. Now let's try and understand when all these changes happened, his, his uh, payment cycles changed, his modal channels on which he was doing the payments changed. What will happen now? Now he would like that not just shopping from home, if he is at this grocery store, now what was the behavior pattern earlier? I can visit a grocery store n number of times and pick up things. 
Now it was, and what was the capacity limited to? The capacity of my car or capacity of my two wheeler or capacity of my bag, how much I can carry. But now the game, game plan will change. It is not just delivery to your home, it's only channel game. You can, the famous quote across onto it is Atawad, AT, anytime, anywhere, from any device. So you can place, this will change the dynamics across of the retail industry when it comes to omni channel. The next thing will be, a lot of things will go contactless. I remember about uh, close to uh, 12, uh, 12 years back, uh, when I visited the uh, Waitrose in uh, Manchester, and uh, I was surprised that they had their uh, uh, handheld devices. So you enter the boutique or uh, the store, you have your shopping cart, you pick and choose your products, which you want, you scan them on your own, you tap your cart and you move out. Do you really need, that was for me, that at that time was a Eureka. We all have seen the videos of uh, the Amazon shop in US or uh, contactless will be the name of game. So there will be, when there is contactless, you need, what will be the mindset of the customer? How secure it is? So you need to ride across on the security aspects as well. Channels, everyone, when we are going on digital, the more secure, the more confidence you give out to your customer that, hey, we value you, we value your uh, data, we value your presence, the better and the quicker you will get the customer uh, on your platform and also the retention will be much, much better. New operating models. Now, Starbucks. Starbucks is already looking around for uh, having on-the-go or drive-through models. This will change. So imagine you don't require a big uh, 2,000, 4,000, 5,000 square feet of space to put up a shop. If you have only on-the-go models, it requires lesser space. Customer is conveniently riding his uh, car and just stops over there. So they, new models will change. I just gave an example of Starbucks. Every company will start looking at the new model, the new operating model in times to come. So that's going to be a go-to market, the go-to market tools out there. Another aspect in go-to-market is, this was a Eureka, a new thing across. Uh, fashion shows. I'm just giving an example of fashion show, the Shanghai fashion show, because everything was online. How do the fashion, how normally the fashion shows happen? We all have heard about uh, the Indian fashion shows and the uh, fashion weeks and all. Uh, normally a fashion show for a particular brand lasts for about 20 to 25 minutes. And uh, you have a limited audience about, of about 100 or 120 uh, key attendees, which includes press as well. And then uh, it lasts for 20, 25 minutes. You sh there is a runway, models walk out over there, and that's all. So you have 120 clients up there. Now, in this environment, when you cannot bring clients over there, and there is uh, safety, security, everything was there, so they, they came up with an option of online. What did online give them? Online first gave them an opportunity to add another 200 potential clients. It was not open for all. It is by invite. It's a select people only. So you increase and widen your audience out over there. So people will, the go-to-market methodologies will change. Many brands will come up with on new models, new ways to entertain and welcome their clients back. There was an uncertainty. And this factor was all about health. This will remain the key focus going forward, whether in terms of uh, uh, is my vitamin C okay or is my vitamin D levels okay, but parallelly industries which are related with health and wellness. Uh, many brands, uh, hospitality industry, they focus on a special cuisines and menus which are around health and wellness, but there will be a special sector, whether it is uh, the insurance sector boost across on health and wellness, there will be a special focus across on uh, sessions around health and wellness, and there will be also sessions around how we can, uh, whether it is uh, the medicinal aspects of this industry will, will, will move out and respond to uh, as an answer to whatever happened in recent past. What is hyperlocal? Now, when it comes to hyperlocal, there will be smaller niche segments which will be created. Like I gave an example across our foodie buddy. Then there was an example of, uh, I, sh I shared with you, private label as well. So there will be more local groups, local brands, local clientele who are, who are capable to serve and excite and delight the customer at, with their, with their uh, product experience. They will be there. Now, another important subject is travel. How will travel transform? This is a big industry. Everything came on a standstill. Nobody is moving out. Nobody is moving in. Travel, tourism, everything is on a stop. 
how will it change? So travel, I have uh, put it across into three different uh, categories across. The first one is my office. I travel to my office. I go to my office. So how will the office environment change? These dynamics will change. They will definitely be, now we have learned to work from home. Now we have learned on adapting ourselves to a different environment. Then comes in our business travel. How will business travel now people have seen that you don't need to travel those frequently. Many of the business decisions are done through Zoom calls. So it will drive efficiency. When it will drive efficiency on business travel, it will lead to further levels of adaptation for the hospitality industry, the hotels, and uh, they're on. The last one, do we, do we ever go and have a hold on this? Never. This is us going out, exploring nature, exploring, uh, meeting friends, going out. We will never stop doing that. We will rather, there will be two different dynamics across. First, secure. So when he was, there was cash problem, cash was preserved. Another aspect was, there is also something which has been in, which says, hey, there is a big level of uncertainty. I don't know what's going to happen about three years down the line, five years down the line. Let me make the best of this movement. That will also be parallelly available. And that will also coexist. Now, between all these behavioral changes, I would end by saying no darkness lasts forever. And even the darkness, there are stars. Guys, you have an opportunity. The opportunity is now. Grab it, take it. Sharpen your skills. The world is waiting for you and the world is going to be brighter. Thank you so much. I am sharing now. And uh, should you have any questions, please uh, let me know. Thank you so much, Mr. Neerajwari. It was really a wonderful session. And thank you so much for making us revisit the whole thing that we've been doing it for almost like one and a half year now and realizing it, how things have changed for us. And as, as a consumer, our behavior has been changed and how the other people are actually tapping this behavior and marketing it. Thank you so very much for that. Now we're moving on to the question and answer que uh, session. Uh, can we have questions from Vinita, please? Vinita, can you please unmute yourself? Nita, I'm audible to you. Okay, moving on. Kangana, do you have any questions? You please unmute yourself. Kangana, you raised hand. Can you please unmute yourself, Peter? You're not audible, Kangana. You're audible. Yeah, now I'm yes. So good evening, sir, and good evening to all the esteemed guests present here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I must say that I was enjoying the presentation a lot. Though I had one question in mind, which is that we learned about the challenges which we as customers faced and the companies found them as opportunities. But what challenges are the luxury brand companies facing uh, due to e-commerce? Okay, thank you so much, Tangana. I think uh, before we go and answer on, uh, before I go and answer across on luxury uh, industry or luxury customers, we need to understand what is luxury. Luxury is all about experience. Luxury is a, is a beautiful journey, is an experience, a product or an experience. And experience is very personal. So when everything goes online, the bigger challenge is how do you deliver that experience to your customer, the welcome, the warmth, the gesture you were giving to your client when, or a customer when he was walking inside your store or walking inside your hotel, how do you ensure the same thing is cascaded down? So it starts not just from the product, it, it's the last mile delivery as well. How, when you open, now imagine then in case uh, e-commerce, you are ordering, uh, let's say, um, uh, a dress for your birthday. And how do I deliver that great experience across for you? It'll be if that, I know if there is your, if it's your birthday, if the box is beautifully done, there are some flowers, there is a handwritten note out over there, and there is a beautiful satin ribbon. And when you open it up, there is a beautiful potpourri inside, which, which gives you a different fragrance inside. And then there is a beautiful dress you chose. That's the experience which is going to last with you. For luxury, I think uh, on e-commerce platforms, it's... Um, there are, there are very few platforms who are delivering this type of experience. I would say uh, Tata Click Luxury is one of those. And uh, experience is the key. So you need to uh, very carefully stitch the last mile. And at times during uh, customers may be visiting your stores. But uh, for example, we do writing instruments. 
and uh, and these tough times when uh, nothing is open and uh, boutiques are closed how do you ensure that when they are writing at home they have uh, the adequate supplies across of the their refills or ink pots and other things like that so all those count across into ensuring these experiences are not disturbed for the clients i hope i managed to answer your question yes thank you moving on to the next one megha tomar can you please ask your question thank you so much ma'am for giving me this opportunity so i have a question that uh, as we all know online selling uses Uh, mostly discounting strategy so uh, do you think that it is a sustainable strategy thank you meda i think uh, every strategy is good the only thing is as long as it keeps the customer in mind there is definitely a customer who is looking out for discounts there is a customer wherein in so look around commodity if you if in commodities if you have two products of the same deliverables the one which has got a better price you will go for that so now it again depends it depends on category to category and commodity to commodity so where you are moving in a cross border experience is invaluable you cannot discount an experience so uh, whether the uh, discount strategy will always sustain the answer is yes but whether it is fits it fits all the product categories the answer is no and whether uh, and it's always the uh, the neighborhood effect you cannot have both going hand in hand on one sh- on the same platform you have discounts and on the on the same platform you have a high experience because then it will not be the same experience to shop for the customer so you need to pick and choose which plat what is what is it that you what is your end objective is product your end objective price benefit your end objective experience your end overall experience your end objective that will define your channel strategy what channel you want to write what you want to tell your customer you want to tell your customer i am the cheapest you want to tell your customer my product is best hey you want to tell your customer come enjoy this product in a great experience i'll give you an amazing experience a good time three things are different yeah thank you so very much thank you so very much for answering me question so wonderfully thank you neeraj valia sir for your time and giving this kind of a perspective to us thank you very much thank you so much thank you very much pleasure over moving ahead moving ahead I have learned about the poetry and wisdom and the grace that can be found in the words of people all around as when we simply take the time to listen save time this quote rightly describes our next speaker Dr Viola Edward partner and executive director at creative women platform ceo co-owner at academy ceo co-owner at kenna breathwork cypress She is internationally awarded an owner of two socially driven businesses personal and corporate advisor psychotherapist systemic systemic breathwork trainer humanitarian and author She pioneered mental health in the space between breathwork therapy and business management She advises clients internationally in cross pollination between self development management and leadership As a psychotherapist she helps clients overcome limitations that hinder their journeys. She uses methodologies related to positive psychotherapy and conscious connected breathing to enhance work cultures and increase engagement in organization. She leverages a global network of experts to deliver the best advice to her clients. She sits on the board of various humanitarian organization and serves as global ambassador for human rights and gender equality. she has strategic partnership and caring alliances her diverse and multicultural background extensive four decades of experience language skills and commitment and love for humanity has given her deep understanding and awareness of human and organization behavior she will be enlightening us on the topic human resource engineering ma'am it's a pleasure to have you as one of our speaker for this conference it is all thank yours you. virtually thank you so much Shika for all this beautiful word and thank you all for creating this event and especially my dear friend of Mentorex that I represent very proudly in Cyprus. Thank you very much. I want to talk about the individual and collective grit as management strategy to retrieve with resilience and be remodeling in a post covid world. In in 1946 the World Health Organization defined health as a holistic concept as a state complete physical 
mental and social well-being, and not only merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This definition includes mental and social dimension and moves to the focus beyond individual physical ability or, or dysfunction. It includes the cognitive, mental, and emotional levels too. It had taken long, long years since then to be able to really see how important it is to get the understanding of this dimension to add to the definition of the ability of the person to connect with the self, knowing the bright side of the self and the shadow side of the self, and develop autonomy and knowledge of the way how she, he, think, learn to transform paradigm and use his and her breathing in a conscious way as a way of honoring life and being aware that where we breathe, we are alive and where we are alive, we have infinite poss possibilities to transform. How is their empathy to others and how is their commitment to co-create the world that all of us we want? For, so for a sustainable productivity and to be able to retrieve using organic resilient and remodeling the path for a caring economy, clarity and mental, health, mental fitness is essential for the flow in the workplace. And I enjoy so much the talk of all of you, especially the talk of Mr. Luke Default, because we resonate in the way how we work. So the flow in the workplace, as he says, is very, very important because it's in the work where we spend the major majority part of our lives, apart from the eight hours for those who have the chance in the, and the luxury to be able to sleep eight hours. Uh, so especially in this particular time that we have been affected in our social life, work, family, in our material world, so many things have changed in our way how we use to live it. It's changed from the way how we know it before, even our expression of affection, even visiting our beloved ones have changed. So if we, if we want to define in, in, in simple way, how we can define mental health fitness. We can say when the person has a synchronicity with what she or he feels, think, do, and models with a grade of autonomy and empathy. It is very important. And many of my colleagues before me had talked about the importance of empathy and the importance of getting back the autonomy of being oneself. And what can be in that way? What, can, what is it in that way of this definition? Actually, we have many things that disturb the way to feel like this, but it's, there is one of a huge impact nowadays. And this is what I want to talk about is the anxiety. Anxiety is one of the bigger challenges that all of us we are facing in one way or another. Of course, when anxiety is in certain level, it can impulse us to do things, to be on time, to to change the setting, to do many things. But when this anxiety change the, the level and get hooked in a higher scale and stay, stay there for hours, for days, for weeks, for months, then it creates other type of dysfunction. Two years ago, the statistics said that it was 32% of people who had suffered of anxiety in their life. Can you imagine? Three of 10 is already a lot. Now, can you imagine how this statistic had been expanded during these 2020 and 2021 with all what we've been exposed to. So mental and emotional health is not anymore a taboo. Well, this is for what I pray for, that it will be never again a taboo. If it is of wise people, and especially leaders and managers, to include in their training and formations for their colleague, for their worker, and for themselves, training related to emotional intelligence and to mental fitness. All of us, we need to learn, all of us, we need to learn about us. All of us, we need to learn about our bright side and our shadow. And how is the bright one that also Mr. Luke talked about is how the bright side that include our qualities, our talent, our beautiful characteristic can help us to minimize and in some way eliminate, eliminate the shadow side. So for a sustainable productivity and to be able to retrieve using organic resilience and remodeling the path for a caring economy, 
This is what I'm so involved nowadays with. What, what is it? So I take this concept and re, re, uh, re-empower them with some of my own concepts. So it's very, it's very important and essential to be more than ever engaged in holistic health for all, education for all. And this is a way of education, how we do. And I know in MentorX, we go all over, we go very frequently and, and in an intense way to, to support and to give different way of, of education and in different languages. Reconnect and reinforce with the grit of people to be able to do their best in their work and their service to their community and society, and also for the planet. Another point will be sustainability start with the self, connecting with the self, with our inner gift and talent to be joyous in life and at work. And from there to others, empathy, social engaged, and honoring and taking care of our home, this planet. Also to create effective matrices, to be able to measure with fine holistic way, the changes that we are obtaining in all what we are doing and to be able to move further and wider accordingly. As the goal 17 of the SDG says, of the United Nations says, let's partner, let's have caring alliances so we can achieve the goal and not leave anyone behind. All of us, we deserve this better quality of life. So what will be the definition of grit? According to Dr. Angela Duckworth, that has been a teacher and later she did a lot of study, psychological study to observe why some children will make it, why some others will not make it. The definition of Dr. Duckworth is grit is courage, conscious, conscientiousness, achievement oriented, long-term, long-term goal and endurance, follow through, willpower, we add willpower, resilience, which is optimism, confidence and creativity, I call it organic resilience because it doesn't matter how many times we, we fall, we can stand up more nurtured and we can share our experience with others and the excellence. And I have to uh, re- remind you here, excellence is the best version of myself today. And we're letting go of this longing for perfection that make us feel all the time not good enough. So let's, let's exchange perfection with excellence. So, and talking about resilience, which also is a subject of this conference. For me, in my own story, is my fourth country of residence, migrant, I'm a serial migrant, many times because of the country where I was in is because of the political situation or because of an imminent war or because of a choice. The fact that I have changed countries many times, my mother tongue have changed three times. And you see this accent that I have now, nowadays I have accent on all the languages I speak. But what is important be having resilient and being resilient is that I speak, not focusing on the accent, is focusing on the message. Not, not only get stuck with all the things that we have lost when we migrate, is connecting with all the things that we find in the new place. Years ago, when I used to be very, very sad about where are my roots, where I belong. And after doing some beautiful therapeutic work and conscious breathing to, to not only uh, re, re, reshape and restart, restructure what was holding me back, but also to clear my body from somatic, somatic uh, stamp that were there for a long, long time. This is what I achieve, I achieve with breath work. And therapy, I come to the conclusion that actually we, it's not that our roots are cut. We have our origin and we can take our origin wherever we go. And this origin can be expanded. And like 10 years ago or 12 years ago, I find a book called Origin from the writer, Lebanese writer who lives in France called Amin Malouf. And he said it in a beautiful way. He says, we are not trees. We don't die when our roots are cut. We take our origin wherever we go. And I have added, and our wings grow bigger and bigger. So we can, we can also fly and, and expand our origin. Look at me. 
I'm of Arabic origin. I'm Venezuelan. I'm living in Cyprus and represent Cyprus. And I'm married with a British Englishman. So imagine how that origin had, had my stepchildren lives in France. And we have to go and, and change languages here and there. And it's true that many times my heart beat faster when I see what's happening to many of my countries. But also the hope is one of the last things that we can lose. And I am... I have great hope in humanity that we will make it together. We can make it because together we can go further. We can go deeper. We can go faster. For this matter, and just in the COVID time, I have transformed part of my business to create with my sister, Laila Edward, the GRIT Academy. GRIT here is an acronym for Growth, Resource, Inspire, and Transform. We have resumed almost 30 years of experience of, in human behavior in different areas of life as a psychotherapist, as consultant, as mentor and coaches to transform that to create an online interactive company with programs that can be used globally in various languages to support worldwide people in their growth and expansion in a kind, dynamic and modern way. Because it's very important for us to keep teaching the importance of this capital, inner capital, the biggest of the capital, the best of the currency for me, it has been my inner resources, my, my, my characteristic, my gift, my talent, as very beautifully Luke was talking about. It's true that I was strong from one continent to another, but also it's true that my currency was always with me. What are my currency, my intuition, my generosity, my connectedness, the way how I communicate, even if I don't know how to speak a language, all these had helped me to, to not only to survive, but also to thrive. It's very important to be inspired to live life to, the, to its full, independently of the circumstances. And also, we influence people around us, doesn't matter how few people or how many people, but we always influence people around us. So it's very important to inspire others to do so, to live life to the full extent. While we transform in a gentle way and being the best version of ourselves. So as we are needed, each, each one of us is a very important, it's, it's, for me, we are drop in the sea. Every drop is part of the big for of this big big ocean and all of us are needed to have a life with meaning for ourselves for our family for our community and for the society this is how we can create all together the world that we all need so even though with my difficulties and the accent i managed to write some books and one of them was written in 1999 and in that book that you can find in amazon it, the name is, is Breathing the Rhythm of Success. Because for me, to have success is not to be on the, on the top of the wave all the time. That's not possible. And for me, to be healthy doesn't mean that I, will, I never get ill. For me, to be healthy is to see how, how is the way I live. And if the, if, if, if the illness touch me, how do I heal? How do I integrate? How do I learn? Same thing about success. Success is the way how I learn from experience, how I help others from my experience, and it's not about making the same mistake again and again. And not to be victimized is to assume the responsibility as an adult of my decision and, my, uh, and the consequences of my action. So in this book, you can see the two of the things that really, really affect us in life. And one is the way how we think and the other way is the way how we think and also the importance of having a purpose and having a vision so i hope you can have this book and enjoy it and do the exercises and if after you have any question for me please through this organization connect with me and i want to end this um my sharing with you uh of a concept of the positive psychotherapy Positive psychotherapy was created in early 70s by Dr. Nostras Peseshkian in Germany, Irani origin. And he used, he says that well-being is not impossible to achieve well-being. It is very is possible. And it has three principles. And one of the principles is positum, 
Positive is coming from Latin and means positum. Positum means what is given, what is there. We have everything we need to be able to deal and to learn and to thrive in life. And also positive means to see the whole picture, not only focus in the negative side. The second principle is to be in balance. And as soon as he said that, he would say, life will take us out of balance. Let's learn and go back to balance. Body, mind, emotion, relation, communication, achievement, reasoning, and meaning of life. And whatever is the, is the area of your devotion. And the third principle is the principle of consultancy. When life takes us off to balance, we use our positum to do whatever we can to get out and to face that challenge and, and go back to balance. But sometimes it's not possible. None of us knows it all. So sometimes all what we know is not enough to be able to deal with this new challenge. And when this situation appears, please go to the principle of consultancy. Ask for your mentor, ask for your coach, ask for your psychotherapist, therapist, doctor, whatever is needed in that situation. And then you will learn accordingly and your positum will be expanded. And we want really, really to be able to, to, to be able to be as a human resource in every part of life, especially to now to engage and re-engineer how we're gonna do with this workforce, being from home, being half half or being out back again, how together we're gonna go into re-engineering the way how we're gonna work, how we're gonna uh, find solution for areas of life, especially here, I want to talk about how many women had been affected in their small businesses, how we're gonna re-engineer all together, starting with the self, starting to understand how we are, to really, really go to this bright part of the self and ask for help to deal with the dark side. And for you, my dear manager, my dear leader, business owner, social entrepreneur, please, please include mental fitness in your programs. Thank you very much for this space and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Vaila, for this wonderful and insightful session about humanity, making us learn about the importance of empathy, the understanding of anxiety, and making us understand and believing that humanity is important. Thank you so very much. I'm moving on to the question and answer round. We'll be taking only two questions. Uh, so the first question would be from Ritik Arora. Ritik, can you please unmute yourself? Sure, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, ma'am, for uh, the much needed wake up call for all of us. And uh, so my question for you would be, what types of challenges are faced by human resource re-engineering companies? Can you please repeat the question? I missed you. I missed the sound a little bit. It's, it's, uh, I'll repeat. Uh, what types of challenges are faced by human resource re-engineering companies? Yes, well, many challenges and one is themselves, you know, because because human resources is not only only one person, human resources in the beginning, beginning, beginning. Uh, I, I start working in the 70s when I was 13 years old. Now I'm 62, so I've been many years here and I worked 21 years in the corporate world from the smaller one to biggest one and uh, before I get my own businesses. And one of the thing is that many human resources, they, they still, are there administrating the human resources. And it's not about administrating. It's about really, really education, prevention, and recovery. You know, it's about being able to be to, to transform, being able to look at our human resources as a whole, not only administrate. Um, and, and I think many times we, we, we can have one or two person who are more, maybe more sensible about all these subjects, but then they, they get absorbed by, this, by, the, by the system. So I would say one thing we, as a consultant, we would love to do, and I used to do in the 90s as a consultant, is that remember consultant, we are aligned with you. We come to work with you as soon as possible to give our subject to train you in human resources, also to continue the work that we start and to leave as soon as possible. Our role as an external consultant is not to stay in your company forever. 
Yes. So if we team together, remember, together is much better. It's much it's greater. If we team and we do this work together, then everybody will benefit. So this is one. The way how human resources department will team with those external consultants that they have chosen to come and do something. The second thing is that it's very important that all the population in an organization be involved when we are uh, we, when we are doing some changes in the cultural organization. And now all of us, we have had a deep change in our cultural organiza organization because of all what happened to us. So it's very important that the, all the level be involved. Yeah, As you know, the people who have the authority not are the people who have the power. The people who have the power to impulse or to put the brake in an action are the people who are doing the actions itself. Like if we talk about an electrical company, we would say the people who have the power are the people who are in the street planting all these post electrical posts. Those are the people who will go to strike. Yeah. But the people who have the authority are up there in, the, in this pyramid. Yeah. So how we can make the distance between power and, and authority, how we can make it shorter. And this is, is through influence and through what, what does it mean? It's, it's how to develop better communication, how to develop a um, culture of participation, career plan, all the things that we have to work in, the, in, the, in a company. And if we want to work it, we have to involve everybody. So we, we, we should not enter as a, as a holistic business consultant or systemic business consultant. I want everybody to be involved in a major or minor way, but everybody to be involved. And of course, we, we have different programs for the organization for their, if we have to review their vision, if we have to review their mission, the, the subject of the values is very important. This, your question is in, very, very important because it's not only about having values in a beautiful frame, it's about what does, what does this value means for me? Because all the conflict in the person and in a couple and in a family, it's not that we don't have values, it's that we, uh, we interpret the values in a different way. So it's very important that time to time we, we refresh and we take to the population of a company what these values that sustain, what are the core values of the company and what the value that sustain this culture and this company means for this population, yes? And refresh that. So there's a lot to do and certainly human resources has a lot of challenges and I admire you deeply and I'm here like all my other colleagues who come before to support you because your work in a company is essential. This organization cannot be without you, human resources. So count on us. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much. Taking the last question for the session, can I ask Purtika Bakshi to please ask the question? Purtika, can you please switch on your cam and unmute yourself? Hello. Yeah, you're audible, Portika. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, ma'am. And uh, uh, my question for today uh, for uh, Dr. Viola uh, is that what's the motto of achievement, whether it's in your personal or in professional life, or what? how you quote yourself of your achievement in personal or in professional life? Well, yeah. Well, as I told you in my, in my sharing, I have exchanged perfection by excellence. So when I'm working with, I'm, I'm a person oriented to achievement, but also I'm a person oriented to connection. So when I have a goal that I want to achieve, I do everything in my hand to, I, I have learned the SWOT and many other smother related that like this word and it's very important to understand that model because to achieve a goal we need to understand how, what what strengths we have for this goal what weaknesses we have what opportunity the outside will give us what threat we have but this this exercise can go further and further so when i'm preparing myself to achieve a goal i do all what i know as i said from my post but i ask for help so I am a person who will never again leave my pain alone. When I did that in my youth, I get into trouble and I went into addiction. And it took me ages to go out of that. So for you young people and every age, please, I beg you, 
don't leave your pain, your shame, or your dark, whatever related to the shadow alone. Ask for help. Nowadays, it's not a taboo anymore. And there are so many people that would be so happy to support you and help you. So I use what I surf. Yeah. So if I get very complicated in, in, in a way to, to design or achieve a goal, I ask for help. And I do everything, everything from myself and from others. And after that, I just detach because I know that there is a higher power. And I know that many times in my life, I wanted so much to do something or to go someplace like India. Can you believe I'm the honorary president of a beautiful organization in India, Charity on Wheel. We do beautiful work for women in prison. But every time I organize to go to India and I do everything, something happened. Like the last trip, it was the COVID. So for me, as much as I love you, as, as, as much as I'm connected with you, and my friend said, your photo is there in that prison. Still, my path is not open to go and see you personally. So this is what I do. I do everything is my, in my hand, and later I don't suffer if it doesn't go through. Because I know there is another agenda for me. All what I learned organizing for this achievement, if it doesn't happen, I extract the beauty of it. I extract whatever I learn. I re-engineer it in another way. And this is what I do. And I hope, I hope uh, uh, that advice can help you. It's not about being detached. It's about being very involved and doing everything I can do and what my mentors say that I have to do. And then I wait and detach from the result if those results are not what I wanted because there is another agenda for me. And I'm 62 and that had worked for me very well. And I'm reinventing myself again and again. And the last re-engineering of myself and my company was now in COVID time. Thank you so much, Dr. Waila. Deeply humbled to have you here. And thank you for this wonderful answer that you gave just now. And thank you for making us learn that how should we re engineer our thoughts so that we be very positive as you are. And hoping to see you soon, I guess, in 2021 in India. Yes, please. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. So thank much. you for, for all. Thank you. Moving ahead. Most think the past equals the future. Decision is the ultimate power, says Tony Robbins. Our next speaker is Mr. Sanjay Bhan, head global business at Hero Motor Corp Limited. He is responsible for global business for Hero Motor Corp. This is his second tenure at HMCL and he served HMCL for over 28 years previously. He joined HMCL at the start of his career and undertook various roles in the sales and after sales function. He's a postgraduate in management from South Gujarat University. In 1991, he joined the company in sales function based out of Vadodara. Looking after the state of Gujarat in 1994, post which he moved on to take charge of Maharashtra as a state head. He went on to head the East Zone based out of Kolkata in 1995 and later took up other key responsibility as head of West and North Zones before, stating, before starting the rural vertical in 2007 and eventually moving on to take over as a marketing head in 2008. As a head of marketing, Sanjay Bhan was responsible for the successful launch of a new brand hero, widely acknowledged as one of the most rebranding exercises, along with hugely successful corporate ca campaign, Hum Mein Hai Hero. He has over three decades of extensive automobile and two-wheeler industry expertise and an intimately deep understanding of consumers and insights across regions. He's an avid sports person who loves football and cricket, and he has also worked with Dunlop India Limited with Ola Electric Mobility Private Limited as its chief business officer between December 2019 and September 2020. He will be speaking on the topic, global business strategy of automobile companies. We are pleased to have you, sir. The audience is all yours. Thank you very much, Shika. I'm just doing a check on, am I audible? Yes, you're audible, sir. All right, allow me to present my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir, it's visible. All right, uh, a very good evening to you all, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. At the outset, I'd like to thank the team at GEMS for having me over for this session and to speak to all of you. 
on the challenges that the global auto companies from a strategy point of view are facing currently. Uh, I had some wonderful speakers before me and I had the privilege of hearing out uh, at least a couple of them. Uh, more recently, Dr. Viola, I think it was a phenomenal session. I have some fabulous stuff that one got to hear and something very, very soul searching. And it's a tough act to follow for that, but I'll try and do my best to help you stay awake. Uh, while the topic did mention the global strategy for auto companies, I thought it may be perhaps a bit more relevant to take a step back and talk to you all about the way auto industry is trying to deal with this new normal during these extremely unprecedented and turbulent times. <clears throat> Let me start by you know, just jumping into it and telling you about this new world. The world as we knew, the world as we knew it has changed and let me remind you perhaps forever. This is not to say that these times shall not pass a change for the better, but to assert that the way we have known the times would have seen a permanent change. While the pandemic has done, what the pandemic has done is to change the order of things in ways unimaginable just a year back. Volatility is the new stable. We all heard about VUCA times, right? Volatility is, volatility is the new stable. Uncertainty is the new expected. Complexity is the new simple. Ambiguity is the new clarity. Welcome to the new normal. So what are we all thinking about? What is going on in our minds? And when I say in our minds, our consumers, us everywhere, the world around us. In this rather interesting time, what are we all thinking about? From virtually a less than 10% rating uh, as a high concern for health two years ago, the rating currently stands at more than 31%, where people believe that it is the highest concern. This data reflects India. If I were to look at what is the other important element that has seen some change, 45% consumers in India believe that disruption and uncertainty is their biggest concern. When you marry the two data points, it is a very, very interesting analogy. And the next data tells you that it's not just an India story. It's happening all across the world. The world is experiencing a massive concern around healthcare. And, you know, save alone the example of UK, because they seem to be more concerned with Brexit than healthcare. That about rest of the world is actually in a very turbulent zone. Uh, make no mistake, I'm not trying to tell you guys that things are not going to change for better. It's just that I want to underscore the point that things, the way they stand, have perhaps changed for us to respond to them differently. How does the auto industry therefore look at this particular change and how are we gearing up to deal with it? I think it will be a nice way and a nice take to actually examine what are the practitioners trying to preach and what are they actually practicing? A significant shift has happened in the industry, really are adopting what I would call a digital first approach as opposed to you know, the physical first approach backed up by digital. Now the, now the entire proposition has moved to digital being digital first. For an industry that for years continued to be the biggest spenders, uh, you know, perhaps the only exception being FMCG in the traditional media, be it the Super Bowl, the La Liga, or the FIFA World Cup, or closer home, the IPL or Big Boss, the realization and hence the approach is now to find out what exactly is ruling in the minds of people. As you can see in the top right-hand quadrant, these are the new apps. And this is a, this is a report published by Aptopia and Mo Engage, which gives you a true flavor of what's happening in the world of apps and who's on top. Clearly, mobility is a pretty is scoring pretty low, and it is a pretty much low in the pegging order with respect to others. For example, video chats and video conferencing, something like what we're doing right now, is more in vogue, right? That th those apps are really doing extremely well. Online sporting, shopping, social media, they're all ruling cross segments. That's the new order that we have seen. We have seen this in India, India too. And the sudden surge of digi digital consumption as a key way of life. Just a few years ago, we were struggling with our numbers, but the advent of the 4G has really shot these numbers through the roof. And to add to it, if you were to look at how this data is really corresponding 
to what percentage of consumers who have who have decided to you know spend more times indoors as opposed to outdoors. It's an it is an absolutely stunning data point. Fifty two percent of our customers in in six Asian countries have declared that they would rather spend time indoors than outdoors. That itself is an indication of where we are headed with this. Now, when that is happening, the media habits change. The, you know, the whole point about what people are consuming has undergone a dramatic and perhaps a tectonic change. People are now looking at short videos. They're looking at OTT platform. People are just finding it too cozy to let go of the Netflix and the, uh, you know, the Amazon Prime of this world. Uh, and people are just hooked on to everything. Television advertising continues to be one of the primary source of, uh, you know, rev avenues for companies to communicate the product. It still stays very stored, solid and, uh, you know, very well ingrained in the minds. So how are the companies therefore responding to the, these new changes from a customer point of view? I mean, before I go to that, I think it's very important to mention that the last time we saw something very similar happen in the world was at the time of the SARS virus in, in parts of China and Hong Kong, as you are all familiar. And that is truly known as the genesis of the e-commerce bubble that just started mushrooming all over China. 32% of respondents at that point in time simply shifted from uh, you know, real life or you know, what you call the hardwired retail business into e-commerce. And that's exactly the trend that we see today. And that's how auto is examining this as the new normal. It's a giant leap really for auto companies to actually embrace the new normal. So a digital leap from a physical retail space to virtual showrooms, a 360 degree immersive experience that is as close as it, as it can get to the touch and feel that typically auto companies have been known for. A physical touch and feel at home, you know, in your comforts, in your confines, in your own secure environments, is what auto companies are now pushing for because these are the new cores of the new normal. You need a loan? Oh, well, earlier you had to apply for a loan and then you know, various companies, NBFCs, loan companies, banks would take all the time they had in the world to come back to you and tell you whether your loan has been approved or not. Today, all you've got to do is fill a few forms, fill in your psychometric form, a small test, and in real time, perhaps in 45 minutes flat, you would get an approval uh, for your loan sitting at home. You don't, have to even, you don't have to even venture out, step out for a minute. And that's how times have changed. And that's how life around us is changing. Owning a vehicle is no more mandatory to buying one. Now that's interesting. Leasing models, for instance, across the world are emerging. They used to be there for premium categories of vehicles, mostly cars, the Mercedes and the BMWs uh, were the ones more familiar with the leasing operations. But today, commuter companies, you know, the Hyundai's and the Baruthis of this world uh, are actually doing a lot of their business to leasing. What does this mean? That you don't have to make upfront investments in the acquisition cost. All you got to do is have a vehicle at your disposal, which is akin to owning one without having to take the burden of its cost. You pay per use. There are some new use cases that seem to have come up in a big way in the past 15 months since the pandemic really broke out. And one such thing is the delivery segment in India, as I think all of you are familiar. Now, this delivery segment is not just an India story. It's, a, it's an across the world phenomenon. Everywhere, one of the biggest things that's seen an upheaval has been the delivery segment. But what it has also done, the pandemic, it's, it's also broken the shackles around or, or kind of tied them into shackles, I'm sorry, uh, of the earlier use cases, which were apparently threatening to become a big order or the new trend. For instance, rideshare. While deliveries on an orbital tra trajectory, rideshare and rentals, rentals are losing some sheen. Clearly the silver lining for global auto industry is the resurgence of personal mobility back in fashion. Bucking a trend that was building up over the past few years, where rideshare and hailing was a strong, better trend. What this has led to auto companies to do is to rationalize their operations, start investing in finding newer ways. And I think uh, the earlier speaker before Dr. Viola, a uh, gentleman called Neeraj, was talking about the experience part. I think the investments that are going in now in R&Ds are not just on products, 
but on creating unique and distinctive experiences engagement for customers. And that's what I'm going to talk in the, uh, in the next slide. There are, we need to consolidate geographies, perhaps look at those markets and those areas where the new models will be far better and far stronger in work, where you don't have over-dependence on physical touch and feel. And of course, network needs to be reasserted and re-examined. The entire channel and distribution strategy of companies is undergoing a phenomenal change. Things are shifting from the real world to a more digital-oriented D2D platform. When I say D2D, I mean discovery, which is right from the st stage where you're going online to figure out what you want. That phase of discovery right on to delivery is now absolutely digital. So it's a DDD, you may as well call it a 3D approach, which is what is redefining the distribution system for organizations. Let me just quickly talk to you about what is this new world and what are the R&Ds really investing? What the pandemic has done that it has firstly brought some, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, what it has done is it brought back some value to own personal mobility solutions because the whole piece about social distancing, trying to stay as far away from people as possible is probably the trigger where people, instead of sharing and hiring and using other vehicles would like to have their own vehicles. And that's, that's the only piece that's happening. But what's also done is that, you know, the earlier paradigm, the age old legacy paradigm of the pride of owning a vehicle is no more the primary driver driving this use. What is driving is the fact that the new order is coming where you need to have something which is clean, hygienic. So hygiene is driving things. And that's where I'm connecting it back to the first slide I shared that health concerns are becoming huge. And this is a trend that's not just available across the world. It's pretty much there visible in India as well. So to restore this pride of the earlier pride and legacy pride of ownership, companies have increasingly started investing in areas of personalizing these vehicles to the extent that you know, people start embracing this new technology, whether it is the IoT, the internet of things, or artificial intelligence, in all formats of two-wheelers, four-wheelers, this is a thing that is absolutely in work. Automobiles are being made to be more like any other gadget that the customers, consumers use in their daily lives, almost like an extension of their own lives, almost an extension of the iPhones that they use. They're going to have a vehicle which is almost behaving like that virtually on command. So don't be surprised then that sooner than later, you could, you might as well imagine the auto industry could be the largest employer of coders and IT engineers, as opposed to automobile and mechanical engineers in the world. Add to it, the industry may also end up being the largest employers for chemical engineers, given the trend on electric mobility, but more of it may be sometime else. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your kind attention. I'm very happy to take any questions you may have. With that, I'll Thank you so very it. much. Thank you so very much, sir. Thank you very much for taking us to the automobile industry and making us learn what exactly is ha happening right now there. Thank you very much for that. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes, uh, so we'll be taking just one question. Uh, now I request uh, Mansi Shahi to please address a question to Mr. Sanjay Bhan. Go ahead, Mansi. Mansi, you're not audible, Vita. Uh, first of all, good evening, sir. Thank you so much for such amazing insights. So I want to ask, what's your take on bigger vehicles such as buses in context of electrical vehicles? Um, are they going to convert into the buses going to convert into electric vehicles or is that feasible? Because Nitin Gadkari in 2019 at a national con conclave said that uh, all the buses in India will uh, will switch to electrical in two or three upcoming years, basically. Well, I think uh, I, I think what uh, the Honorable Minister mentioned, and I guess uh, what he meant was uh, there's, there's a government desire, an intense desire to actually move to alternate energy for multiple reasons. A, uh, I'm sure that you recognize the fact that India doesn't produce oil. It has to buy oil. So there's a huge forex bill that we have to pay. Uh, and that obviously is a big saving. Uh, that's the first part. The second part, perhaps as important, if not more important, is the kind of impact um, automobiles, particularly buses, the you know the diesel vehicles, the buses, the uh, 
you know, trucks, etc. The amount of pollution they probably lead to is, is a challenge. And hence, to minimize that, uh, the need for India to electrify uh, its, um, its passenger vehicle and uh, transportation sector has always been a big mandate for the government. They have increasingly uh, worked around it. The only uh, challenge that we foresee at this stage uh, is the fact that, uh, you know, collectively as a, as a country, we need to put the right amount of infrastructure in place for that adoption to happen faster. The intent is right there. I think there's a lot of work that's already started. People are looking at, and there are quite a few Indian players who already developed these electric buses. The challenge there is the amount of charging time it requires and the available infrastructure to charge those vehicles and those batteries in good time. So it, once more technologies are, I think this adoption will be simpler. But the net end game would remain that yes, there would be electric is the future clearly for most of these categories. And I, I see no reason why all of us shouldn't believe uh, that the minister, what he said, he actually meant and therefore uh, we will see these electric buses, buses on our roads very soon. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much for spending time for us. Have Thank a great evening, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Moving ahead, our next speaker. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it say Simon Sinek. Our next speaker defines this precisely. He is Dr. Justin Paul from University of Puerto Rico, San Juan PR, USA, and distinguished professor IIM Kerala and SIBM. He serves as editor-in-chief of A-ranked International Journal of Consumer Studies and as associate editor of Journal of Business Research. A former faculty member with the University of Washington, he is serving as full professor of PhD and MBA programs, University of Puerto Rico, USA. He holds three honorary titles as distinguished professor with three reputed universities, including IIM Kerala and SIBM Pune. He's known as, uh, he's known as an author, co-author of books such as Business Environment, International Marketing, Services Marketing, Export Import Management, Management of Banking and Financial Services by McGraw Hill, Oxford University Press and Pearson respectively. He serves as an associate editor with Journal of Business Research, European Management Journal and Journal of Strategic Marketing. Dr. Paul introduced the Maastricht model and measure for brand management, CPP model for internationalization, scope framework for small and 7P framework for international marketing. His articles have been downloaded over 800,000 times during the last six years. As an author of 110 research papers in SSCI journals, Justin Paul has over 70 papers which are in A or ASR journals. He will be speaking on the topic, Managing Business in COVID Crisis and Effective Strategies in Post-COVID Era. So it's a great honor for us to hear you talk on this platform. The audience is all yours, Justin Paul, sir. Thank you. Am I audible to you? Yes, you're audible, sir. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure I can use my PowerPoint or I can also send it to you. Maybe I can try to open mine first and then see. Okay, so. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. No problem. Can you hear me perfectly? Yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah, in case if there is a core problem, I can use another laptop. It's perfectly fine, so you can go. Ahead. Where is my share options? Yes, I know you. Yeah, okay. So you got my PPT, right? Okay. Yes, sir. I'll go with yours. Thank you very much for this invitation. And um, uh, it's an honor for me to be with you today to share some of my thoughts and some of my uh, stories relating to the COVID-19 and solution to some of these problems that we all face uh, during uh, COVID crisis time. And this has been a challenging year. 
And we all know that COVID-19 has brought about wide array of challenges and opportunities. And COVID-19 is uh, going to be a problem for another year or so. So we need to manage our businesses and our life uh, in the COVID era strategically, diplomatically, and sincerely. So my uh, talk today will cover three aspects, the context, context and uh, some stories and, and some solutions. Uh, context, as you know, this conference is all about COVID-19 and some of the speeches are also relating to COVID-19 and I will talk about COVID-19 a little bit. COVID-19 has its own implications, so far-reaching implications. We all have some problems or other type of problems. Some people have some problems in their own personal life. They lost their jobs. They have their salary level remuneration is uh, less now, or they have risk and uncertainty. And some small businesses, they have shut down their operations. And big businesses, they have retrenched their employees hotels and tourism and some sectors like that are very sensitive to the tourism and very sensitive to this kind of crisis are also facing a lot of problems. Global economy, if we start with global economy, global economy is expected to shrink. Global economy is actually is facing a lot of challenge these days because everywhere, uh, many companies have retrenched their employees and they have moved to a different kind of employment system. Millions have filed unemployment benefits across the countries in America. Millions uh, have filed unemployment benefits. And because um, uh, you know America was badly hit because of COVID-19 last year, this year America has already recovered. And America is now almost, you can say, is getting into a kind of stage where America has become a COVID-free country with the uh, American president announcing that um, uh, people, those who have got two access, need two, two, two doses of vaccine need not wear masks. I got my two doses of vaccine in March and um, according to the U.S. president's announcement, latest announcement, I don't need to wear a mask when I go outside. On the other hand, India didn't take enough precaution and India is facing a lot of problems. Blame it on uh, people, those who are in power, I have to say that way because those who are in power need to be responsible. Otherwise, there's no point in voting for the people, those who are not responsible for the people. So uh, that is a different political issue. But in any case, um, if you actually look at, um, uh, uh, you know, the situation in America and India, America managed in a much better way compared to India. So they should have done a better way. I feel sympathy because even I had problems in terms of, uh, traveling to India and everybody has some problems. Those who are associated with India are facing some problems or other problems because of COVID-19. Some of us have lost relatives, friends, a lot of, lot of issues like that. COVID-19 has made companies, if you actually look at from the business point of view, business uh, firms or business uh, companies, those who run businesses, they have to search for new opportunities. They have to rewrite their business plan because traditional business plan based on that, they were built upon their businesses are not working now. So they need a different model. They need a different business plan. And um, yeah, so um, I would also be happy to share some stories which uh, would probably uh, be a good idea. For example, maybe you can move, who is moving my slides? So just move very quickly. Yeah, because I got a lot of slides. So uh, yeah, keep moving my slide. Yeah, there has been setback on transactions. If you look at small and medium scale companies, small and medium scale companies, they have they have more and more problems these days. I tell you some example from America. I tell you some example, one or two example from India too. Uh, I used to go to a Chinese restaurant in my city. Sometimes I like uh, uh, tasting uh, food from different countries. And this Chinese restaurant uh, used to be run by a Chinese lady who migrated to America as a cook in a Chinese restaurant. And after working as a cook for 10 years, she wanted to be an entrepreneur and she decided to set up three restaurants, Chinese restaurants, and she was running that successfully, reasonably with some kind of profit margin. However, when COVID-19 was hit uh, America or all over the world, COVID-19 actually hit all, the, all over the world, uh, you know, governments announced lockdown and uh, during the lockdown time, two, three months of lockdown last year, she had to close down her restaurant and she was not able to pay rent of the property where she was running her restaurant and she was not owning the 
uh, uh, buildings. She was leasing the property to run her restaurants and she decided to, you know, and, and she could not pay the rent because commercial property rent is much more than residential property rent. And the owner of the property decided to terminate her lease agreement and she had to close down her restaurant as an outcome. So the result, the end result was that she, she lost her business. She turned out to be unemployed so, and she lost her money, everything like that. So there are so many examples like that. Uh, you know, there are so many hotels in my locations because I live in a tourist uh, location where next to my building is one of the famous beaches. And uh, there are a lot of five star and four star hotels in and around my place. And I go for my morning walk sometimes and I find that there are no people around those hotels these days or for last one and a half year. So ever since the COVID started, there are no people and, and these hotels are empty and they have already terminated their employees and they have a huge setback and they are facing a challenge. And, and this, is, this is another example. So there are so many examples. I, I know another example, one of the uh, faculty members from an IIT, uh, this is a lady faculty member. She told uh, me that um, her husband um, is a small entrepreneur uh, and, and uh, her husband has no income now. So she is regretting that why she did get married to that man who has no income now. So this is another uh, you know, aftermath of COVID-19 crisis. So there are so many problems like this. And these are, these are some, some problems. Plus, uh, there are also uh, deaths and other things all over the world. So this is a challenge. So anyway, these are the context and, and some stories. And we have to overcome these challenges. How do we overcome this challenge? That is my next point. And, and companies need to think about and rethink about the strategies and what kind of strategies can be implemented. Yeah, let's move on. So I, I would like to present some strategic framework, 7P constructs for you to rewrite business plans. I would say that in order to survive and succeed in the COVID era or post COVID era, we need a new business plan. How do we write a new business plan? Or we need a new marketing plan, a new marketing plan, a new marketing idea, a new model that will definitely help and i have some 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 ideas for that yeah social distancing is these days uh, everywhere mm -hmm. these you know so many 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 of these rules new rules have resulted into increasing importance for online transactions on the dark side of covid-19 i talked about some some examples but there are also bright side of covid-19 my one of my cousin, he lives in uh, California and he works for a, a digital platform based company called NVIDIA. So they are into games and those kind of things, online games and their business has increased. And there are some companies that way, th those who have actually focused on digital businesses, they have increased their revenue and, and they, they, they are uh, the beneficiaries of this crisis because any, any organization, those who are any organization that is depending upon, uh, you know, online businesses. And, uh, you know, travel and tourism industry, they are badly hit. This include travel agencies, monuments, restaurants, and hotels located in tourist locations. So, and, and I, I give you one more example. There's a very famous cafe called Hard Rock Cafe in America. So it's a very famous brand and they have, they have their branches everywhere in America. They have some branches outside America too. And this Hard Rock Cafe, there is a Hard Rock Cafe in my city where I live too. And Hard Rock Cafe was locked, I mean, was shut down during the lockdown time, two, three months. And after the two, three months lockdown time, they decided to shut down their business permanently because they realized that th their main customers are young people and young people, they go there to, to meet each other and to hang out and have good time. And, and this business is not going to be there for next one or two years. So they realized they had foreseen that and, and, and they decided to shut down their business, Hard Rock Cafe, very famous brand in, in restaurant industry or in, in uh, restaurant and bar industry. So another point is that exclusive distribution is dead because of this COVID-19 and these days selective distribution is getting more importance. And uh, our intensity was selective distribution. There is uh, no scope for exclusive distribution if you think in terms of marketing language for next two or three years. And, and customers are not preferring to pay for premium brands these days as part of saving strategy because when they face uncertainty, uncertainty 
they do not want to pay for premium brands. This is the mindset of customers these days. As a result, brand managers have tough time and they will have tough and rough and rough and time, tough time for next two years. And these days, if you look at newspaper, media industry, they, they are not getting much advertisements because companies, those who have been spending a lot of money for advertisement, they have cut down their budget for advertisement. So media industry is also facing a challenge in terms of managing their business uh, on profit basis. And as we all know, artificial intelligence are getting more important, like robots, chatbots, and those kind of things will be more and more important uh, in, in the days to come. And uh, our early wage rate system will get more importance and world uh, our early wage rate system, you know, so we all used to have kind of permanent job and monthly salary, yearly salary, secure job, those kind of things. So that is being changed now because in the context of COVID-19, if you think about it, you will see that many companies and many organizations, including academic institutions, will move towards uh, more than 50% of employees hired on an hourly wage system. Traditionally, 90% employees were hired on permanent system and 10% were on hourly system. But these days, but in the next uh, couple of years, we will see that more and more employees will be hired on an hourly wage system everywhere in the world. And world is also likely to be divided into two diplomatic team, one team under the US and second team under China. And, and India may be with the US and Pakistan may be with China. So you'll see those kind of uh, changes as well. Yeah. So my, yeah, move on. Hospitality industries are badly hit and are facing serious problems during, uh, you know, will face serious problem during next two years. And, and uh, students, those who are studying hospitality industry, they will be unemployed, not out, because the industry will not employ anybody for next two years, hospitality and tourism industry. And, and even uh, the, the education institutions offering courses in hospitality and tourism, they will not get enough students to study for next two, three years. This is also going to be another challenge. Airline industry is also facing challenge because people are scared to travel. I, I, I was supposed to travel to India on 8th of May I still, and I postponed to 30th of May. Now I don't know whether I can still travel. So there are a lot of uncertainty in life these days for many of us in one way or other way. So movie theaters are not getting people to go inside these days all over the world. And uh, yeah, so this is, this, is a, this, is, this is the new normal. So we have to accept it and we have to deal with how to overcome these challenges. Yeah, next. And I'm, I'm moving on to some solution. Solutions, solution number one, organization, those who are doing business using traditional brick and mortar channel. They need to think about digital solutions. For example, if they don't use digital platform, if they don't use mobile apps, if they don't use their website to do business, to leverage the business opportunity, they have to, it is high time that they have to think about using mobile apps for their business. It is high time for them to think about website and e-commerce portals for their business. Even restaurant can use mobile apps to deliver food and get the order for food delivery and so many things. So many enterprises, grocery stores can use digital solutions. So, that, so they need to move, they need to think in that direction. It is high time that everybody thinks about digital solutions and digital marketing and digital uh, channels. It's, uh, it's increasingly important these days to, to survive and succeed. And another point which I have is the 7P framework for business plan. You have to rewrite your business plan. You have to rethink about your marketing plan. Whatever you teach or whatever you study, uh, traditionally or whatever you learned during last 20 years are not important uh, these days are not going to be important these days textbook need to be rewritten i have written several textbooks but i'm not getting time to rewrite my books but even if so so you can rewrite your business plan if you are a teacher you have to teach uh, in a different way to rewrite business plan some of the ideas that i would like to give you is that uh, with this powerpoint slide performance what i would like to imagine and visualize and share with you is that Companies need to think about performance more holistically. And this holistic way of thinking performance as part of business plan is performance is a function of potential path, process, pace, pattern, and problems. For example, problems. Problems were never considered as part of preparing a business plan. So COVID-19 gives us insights about the importance of taking into account the likely problem that we might face in our business, in our life, when you prepare a business plan or marketing plan. 
So you have to integrate, you have to take into account problems as part of your business plan when you prepare a business plan for your future business or how do you do your business in the days to come. And these problems can be anticipated problems and unanticipated problem. In other, way, in other words, I can say expected problems and unexpected problem. Think about what are the expected problems you will face for next three years or next five years when you prepare your business plan and marketing, marketing plan. And think about what are the, what are the unexpected problems uh, that you might face next three years or next five years, like COVID-19 was an unexpected problem. In case if you, are, if you were able to take into account those things and foresee those things, you can overcome those challenges and you need to have some strategies to uh, overcome these challenges in case if expected problem occurs, if unexpected problem occurs. So I highlight problems as part of business plan, as part of the 7P framework. This is a 7P framework which I prepared with Dr. Eric Maas, uh, who was working with the uh, uh, University of North Texas, and uh, now he's joining Indiana University in the US. And potential, potentially is another important P construct which I would like to suggest. These are not traditional marketing piece. These are completely, totally different 7P sets, uh, uh, you know, so potential, you have to realize your potential. Where is your market potential? Is it going to be in your own country, your own, your own state, your own district, or somewhere else? Identify that in a diplomatic way. Path, path is your growth path. How do you grow your business? You need to discuss and you need to deliberate this in advance in your marketing and business plan. This is very important for success and performance. Success and performance is a function of these six Ps. That is what I would like to highlight today process, what processes that you will follow to succeed on your way to perform better and organic growth strategy and inorganic growth strategy. These are the two types of strategies. Will you follow organic growth processes or will you follow inorganic growth processes? Inorganic growth processes include a lot of collaborations, a lot of interdependence, a lot of strategic alliances. They are all part of inorganic processes. So you have to decide what processes are better for your company, looking at your industry, looking at the competition in your sector. This is very important. And pace, pace is the speed of doing business, at whether considering the COVID-19, for example, you are running a business or you're going to set up a new business, what kind of pace will have, you will prefer? What kind of pace are you going to be doing your business with their devil sense of enterprise and their devil speed of enterprise? Or are you going to be a slow business person or a slow businessman or slow businesswoman like a tortoise, or will you will be having medium, medium speed, medium pace. You have to decide that. What is your pace of doing business? And pattern, pattern is also important. Traditionally, most companies have been doing business with just one product or one or two or one or two product lines. So you have to think about pattern, pattern of, of your product. And this can be also discussed and thought about in terms of your market pattern, market diversification. So product portfolio pattern can be further classified into product portfolio and market portfolio. So what kind of product portfolio you will have as, you, as a company and what kind of market portfolio you will have as a, com as a company. So this is also important. And integrate all these P constructs, you can perform better in the COVID-19. This is what I would like to suggest and I would like to prescribe as a solution to the problems. And if you can successfully identify these six P constructs, your seventh P is performance. Performance is a function of these six Ps. And you can perform much better uh, if, in case if you can integrate these six Ps uh, identically and, and ideologically and diplomatically, scientifically, and in an appropriate way. If you, can, if you can do it, you can succeed. Otherwise, your survival and success will be uh, a, a question mark, a million dollar question. For example, I tell you, uh, this is based on my experience and whatever I have learned. Uh, success is a process. Success is like a journey. Never put a full stop on your way to succeed. And in case uh, if you put a full stop, that is the end of your success. So uh, consider success or performance as a process. It's a continuous process. Never put an end to your process of success because there is no limit uh, you know, so you have to you have to take it. You have to think that there is no limit to your success. Nothing is impossible, provided you can work very hard and you can identify some of these things and and uh, uh, try to find solutions for your problems in terms of managing everything with a structured way using these P construct. These P constructs are more important than the traditional four Ps in marketing, in my opinion. We have already learned that, but those are not very important in, in the COVID-19 time. Problems, I would like to repeat, uh, don't forget to include problems when you're as part of your business plan and marketing plan. 
expected problem and unexpected problem. I would like to repeat that point. And if you can do that, your success probability will be very high. And in case I, I would like to wind up with the message that uh, there is solution to every problem that we face, there is a solution provided you have the thought process and you have the dedication and determination to achieve success and do better and achieve better performance. If you have any question, I would be happy to answer your questions and uh, my lecture for all, all, all these lectures and similar lectures are available on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Paul. videos are available. You can subscribe and uh, watch this uh, uh, free of cost uh, later. You can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook. It's uh, facebook.com slash Paul and twitter.com slash Paul. All my identity is DR Justin Paul. Thank you very much. And if you have time, I can answer question. I know that you're waiting for more renowned uh, uh, gurus. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so uh, I'm not sure whether you have enough time. In case if you have time, I can answer a couple of questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul, for this wonderful session. And thank you so much for explaining us the seven piece framework, which is very much required in this new normal. And specifically for the students who are budding entrepreneurs right now, who really need to understand this framework before they apply and this kind of a strategy or they can come up with a new kind of a business plan. Thank you so much for sparing time for us. Uh, we can have one question from Tanisha Satija. Tanisha, can you please unmute yourself? Uh, am I audible? You are audible, Tanisha. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, first of all, indeed, it was a great session, sir. And we are thankful for your insights. Uh, although you've already explained in your presentation, but I would like to ask what kind of strategies do you suggest for the startups or the small businesses to be able to uh, be profitable in the business in such COVID crisis? Yeah, the framework that I suggested is more useful for startups and startups because you have to consider performance. You know, sometimes uh, you go by notions and perceptions. So success in life or success in business is not based on perception and it's not uh, full of process. So that is why I, I said that performance is a function of your path, your processes, your uh, pace of doing business. And you have to understand all this holistically. You understand, so performance is on the left-hand side. So all these P can be put as an equation. Performance is a function of potential, a path, process, pattern, pace, and problems. And those other six Ps are on the right-hand side and performance is on the left-hand side. That is the solution that I would like to describe. And in case if you can holistically analyze other Ps well in advance, and, and, and then you can uh, perform better in future for a startup or, a, or an existing small and medium enterprise. Look at all these things in advance. You have to prepare a business plan or a marketing plan like, a, like a, for example, you are constructing a building. You, you, you have a plan, right? The same way. You need to have a proper plan looking at these P constructs. This is what I would prescribe or I would suggest. I have an article on this uh, topic also in case if you want me to send an article, shoot me an email, profjust at gmail.com. Thank you. Sure, sir. Thank, Thank you so you. much, sir. Thank you very much, Justin Paul, for your time, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, moving ahead, the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is that little extra, says Jimmy Johnson. I am profoundly overjoyed to take this opportunity to introduce our chief guest of the evening, Mr. Rohit Khosla. Executive Vice President, Operations Indian Hotels Company Limited. A postgraduate in hotel management from the Institute of Hotel Management, Mumbai, joined the Taj Group in the year 1999 as Executive Assistant Manager, Taj Palace Hotel, New Delhi, and has held several positions within the group in India, Yemen, Maldives, and Sri Lanka. He has shown unwavering support and dedication to the Taj brand. He has won numerous industry awards, including the Young Hotel General Manager in 2006, by the Federation of Hotel and Restaurant Association of India. He was also awarded the General Manager of the Year in 2006 at the Stars of the Industry Award by IIT, ITM Institute and DNA. He was a member of the Executive Committee of the Hotel Association of Sri Lanka from 2011 to 15. He was also the President of SKAL International Colombo in 2014-15. I read in one of his interview where he has mentioned that hoteliers have traditionally seen themselves as innkeepers 
now it's time for them to be businessmen in keepers as caring of their guests as they're one of the top line. I request Rohit Kotla sir to please address the audience and we are delighted to have you in this evening. Thank you. Uh, just a sound check, can you hear me? Yes sir, you're audible. Thank you. Um, uh, I think I'll, scare, I'll just share my screen. Are my slides visible to everybody? Yes, sir. Okay. So, good evening once again. Thank you. Uh, dear Chairman Jim, uh, Dr. Gipta, Gupta, uh, Director Dr. Thar, fellow speakers, faculty, and their students, actually our future. I would like to start by congratulating Jim for organizing uh, the International Conference on Retrieval, Resilience, and Remodeling in the post-COVID world. We've had outstanding speakers uh, this afternoon and evening, and uh, they've shared great thoughts, which were, have been very, very provoking uh, ideas applicable to personal, professional, and, and to business life. Um, Dr. Jindal, Luke, uh, my fellow Tata colleague, uh, Neera Jwalia, Sanjay Bhan, Dr. Viola, and now uh, Professor Paul. Uh, <clears throat> I couldn't agree more with Professor Paul when when he said that the travel and tourism industry has been worst hit by this pandemic. And uh, COVID-19 has actually been the biggest black swan event uh, that the tourism industry has faced in its uh, known history. Uh, as you are all aware, and I don't know whether you may be aware or not, but I'll just recollect uh, some, some uh, statistics uh, for you before I start my presentation, that the travel and tourism industry worldwide contributes to up to 10% of the global GDP and contributes to 11% of direct and indirect employment. So it's a very significant part of the economic uh, business cycle of the world. And this has been hit very, very badly. Uh, so survival, revival, thrival. These are the strategies that we need to put in place in order to pass this very, very dramatic unexplained, uh, difficult, painful uh, situation that all of us are going through, especially in the travel and tourism industry. In business schools, no one teaches us how to manage business with a zero dollar top line. But that is what has happened. In the travel and tourism and hospitality industry, we've had, we've had closures because of lockdown with zero top line. How do you manage to survive when you have no income. And so therefore, it is, it is imperative and, and it's a matter of survival that you have to redefine your business model to battle the effects of COVID-19. And, and you have to do that with strategy. I use the word strategy because there has a very important part of strategy and a combination of agility. Speed is, is key in this highly competitive world. So while I did say hope is important, but hope cannot be a strategy. So uh, I want to take some time and take all of you through what has been the journey at IHCF. How have we dealt with this biggest black swan event that has hit us in our history? And what is it that we have done in able to come out of this very, very dark time? We are still actually in it. The first phase got over, we saw some light, some glimmer of hope, and now we are in the second wave, which is obviously much worse than the first wave was. So I'd like to start and, and uh, you know, I have to say that uh, for us, the Tara Group is, the India, is India's foremost value-based corporation. It's a visionary, pioneering, uh, leader, and is invoking trust since 1868. Tata Sons is the principal investment holding company and promoter of Tata companies. 66% of the equity share capital of Tata Sons is held by philanthropic trusts, which support education, health, livelihood generation, art, and culture. The 10 large business verticals that the, the group is in with over 100 operating companies and in, operate in over 100 companies in six continents, 
with over 720,000 employees. The turnover in a good year, that is 2019, was over $106 billion. I want to talk about now uh, IHCL in itself, but I think um, I may not be able to just do justice in the very short period of time. So I'll, I'll seek your indulgence in showing you a short video uh, that should be able to communicate the thought behind the IHCL today. I hope you can hear the video. Yes, that'd be good. Thank you. 
So with that, uh, I just wanted to restart again and, and tell you about our values and our purpose. Our uh, values are ingrained in everything that we do and uh, Tajness is a key value. Uh, it's built on three broad pillars of trust, awareness, and joy. As an organization, which is a value-led organization, our values are very, very important to us. Whatever we do needs to generate trust amongst all stakeholders. It needs to have seamless communication and alignment with all stakeholders, and also create a sense of joy for all stakeholders. So we started off uh, in 2018 with, an, with Aspiration 2022. And Aspiration 2022 basically looked like something like this, which said that we would want to be by 2022, an iconic and profitable hospitality company, which would be based on certain initiatives like reimagining, uh, restructuring, re-engineering, with some enablers of culture, strong bank equity, high customer engagement, pan India footprint, and market leaders in the Asian segment. But more importantly, like I mentioned, that it had to be on the base of trust, awareness, and joy. These are the values of the IHCL and of the Tata Group of integrity, excellence, unity, responsibility, and pioneering. We, we set out to have an 8% a margin expansion in terms of EBITDA. We want to do 15 new projects every year, and we wanted to convert our hotel to an asset right organization, which is a 50-50, wherein we owned 50% and managed 50%. So what did we achieve? We achieved before the pandemic, we achieved a 200 hotel portfolio. We achieved that 50 new hotels were signed. We had uh, 18 new hotels that opened and we had a 43% management contract mix vis-a-vis -vis the 50% we had targeted all in the span of two and a half years. Uh, how did it impact our performance? And our performance in terms of a bitter, like I mentioned, we were a loss-making organization and Pat in 2015. And then in 2016, it was again 63 crores. But then when we launched Aspiration 2022 and we remodeled a business, we went to a positive Pat of 101 in 2017-18, uh, 287 crores in 18-19, and 350 crores in 1920. Everything was looking great. Revenue was climbing, as you can see. And so therefore, things were looking very, very rosy. Uh, EBITDA margin expansion quarter on quarter, because ours is a very seasonal business, uh, while the year is important, but quarter to quarter improvement is also very important. And as these graphs can demonstrate to you, quarter one, last three years, Tremendous amount of improvement, so in quarter two, so in quarter three, which was a huge improvement, and also in quarter four. So overall, Aspiration 2022 was on the right track. We reimagined our brand scape, brand equity like always, diverse and enabling like never before. So brand equity is what we focused on, and we moved from a branded house to a house of brands. And as you can see, we have IHCL in the center, the main brands on the side, which are the hotel brands. And then there's our brands of expression and food and beverage, which we expanded into uh, in the market. So we reworked on and relaunched a brand called Vivanta. We reworked and reimagined Ginger. Re we reimagined an airline catering service called Taj Sats. We reimagined and relaunched the most premium club in the country, the chambers. We also uh, expanded the footprint of, of chambers and moved it beyond uh, the borders of India into Dubai and very soon now into London. Uh, we launched a homestay brand called AMA. We launched a fitness and a wellness brand, the new and now. Uh, we had selections, which I already mentioned, and expressions, which is a food and beverage brand. In expressions, I want to talk to you a little bit about what do we have? We have Jiva spas, 72 spas across the world, 13 Kasana boutiques, 37 salons, 380 restaurants, seven chambers, and 38 homestay products that are currently being offered to our valuable guests. So from a hotel business, we went into a hospitality ecosystem and built 
subsequent businesses which which were top line drivers margin enhancers and market share drivers it did result in something because at the end of it in 2020 the taj was voted as india's strongest brand by brand finance brand value report uh, the tata brand obviously broke the 20 billion dollar mark in terms of just brand value and as you can see the taj was the number one brand in 2020. So Aspiration 2022 was yielding great results because we said we want to be iconic and the brand was becoming iconic. We said we want to be profitable and the company was profitable. We won numerous awards and accolades, uh, whether it was the Condé Nast Traveler Best Hotels in the World, whether the Traveler Leisure Best Hotels in the World, the Hot List, the Michelin Guide, the Earth Check, my, my, my Sustainability, and we were for three years in a running the best hotel in the world, the Taj Mahal Palace and Tower in Mumbai. And then we were hit with COVID-19. The biggest black swan event to hit the travel and tourism industry, especially in India. RevPAR is a calculation of how hotels do. Uh, just to explain to all of you on the call, RevPAR is revenue per available room. So what you do is you take your total revenue, uh, room revenue, and you divide by the total number of rooms that are there in each hotel to come to a metric which can be common and can be compared across geographies. In Europe, there was a 59% decline in RevPAR. In North America, 64%. In the Middle East and uh, North Africa region, 56%. And in the ASPAC, it was 71%. In India, we had a 60% drop in rev power. We had a 90,000 crore revenue loss in the industry. We had um, a 30 percentage uh, basis point drop in occupancy and an 18 to 20% drop in average daily rate. COVID-19 hit us hard. So, uh, like I mentioned, to survive, you have to, uh, you have to reimagine your business model. And we pressed the reset button and came out with the reset strategy, the IHCL reset strategy of 2020, which addressed five key pillars of revenue growth, excellence, spend optimization, effect, effective asset management, and thrift and financial prudence. All these initiatives, as you, can, as you can imagine, and I will elucidate a bit, and I'll not spend too much time because I don't have that much time today, but all these initiatives are built on a strong foundation of communication within the organization, creating a sense of ownership for these initiatives and having a very robust review mechanism. So when we looked at revenue, we looked at promotions, FN food and beverage innovations, quarantine, medical business, new brands, businesses, reimagination of new brands. We looked at Tajness, uh, uh, like I said, that was a value. We looked at it, a commitment re-strengthened because there's a lot more focus on health, hygiene, sanitation. That was a new requirement and the new norm uh, with COVID-19. We looked at service to the nation because the community is the most important stakeholder and is just not uh, another stakeholder. And therefore, we looked at service to the community and service to the nation, and I will talk about it in a bit. We looked at Isaac Zest, which is a digital transformation, which we made into zero touch for at most of our locations for our guests. We did Taj for family, which is all about volunteering and donating. And we did employee-focused initiatives, which is, was important. We looked at uh, spend optimization, payroll optimization, hotel operating costs, and leveraging partnerships. We looked at lease and rental waivers, sale of non-core assets, sale and manage back, and agreement uh, to uh, you know, buy back certain shares. We went into thrift and financial prudence. Cash is king. We heard that earlier, which is very important. Liquidity, liquidity and cash flow management was critical for our survival. So what were the strategies that ultimately came out? What are the products that people saw? People saw something called 4D, which was dream, drive, discover, delight because people want to get out after the first lock and the unlock happened. People want to get out of the houses and nobody want to travel by air or by train. Everybody want to get into the safety of the car and drive. 
So driving holidays became a very, very big revenue generator for us during the pandemic and the lockdown. We started pre-purchase of certain services under World of Privileges and the Chambers was redefined and relaunched. We went in and uh, expanded our AMA portfolio because people wanted to be away and alone and not in crowded places. They wanted to be in private spaces and AMA allows private spaces and private vacations. We launched a home delivery and we were the first ones to do our in-house app on the, with, with partnership with Tata Digital and launched our own app form, which is a three, you know, which is called Cumin. And, and Cumin has got home delivery, it has got shops and very soon uh, food delivery trucks. We had uh, Taj Hospitality at Home, Seven Rivers Brew Pub and Anuka, a brand that we launched out of our airline catering business. What did we get? The result of this was a 264 crore growth in revenue, 420 crore uh, uh, saving in cost, uh, 70 crore addition due to effective uh, asset management and, and a saving of 135 crores in purely managing financials and financial costs. So what happened? There was a recovery as you can see and in quarter one of last year, when we talk about April, 2020, it was a big disaster where we were, we were just 15% um, um, of the previous year. And how we grew quarter to quarter from 15% to 28% to 52% to 72% of the previous year, 2019. And our research strategy gave us some very good results and was very, very enlightening. And also the share market looked at our, our, our share price. And what was our share price in January, 2020? What happened to our share price in March 20 when the, when the pandemic hit us? And then how with reset, we were able to climb back to 128 at the end of December. Currently we are at 130. Uh, for an organization uh, that, has, uh, that has a market cap in India of uh, 15,000 uh, crores, um, uh, that is quite significant for many of our shareholders in terms of shareholder return. We also did something that was rising to the occasion. We, like I mentioned, Tajness is a value which is the center of all that we do. It's the center of a universe. We looked at commitment, compassion, change agents, contribution, collaboration, creativity. So our commitment was towards health and well-being, towards positivity and hope amongst all our stakeholders. It was towards serving the nation and caring for our employees. It was towards developing new business models and innovative campaigns to attract new markets. There were new ways of working, uh, you know, collapsing the organization, removing bureaucratic um, uh, unnecessary layers uh, in organization, making it fast and agile, uh, reducing corporate overheads, embracing digital, which was a very, very important learning for us and, and leverage our, our relationship and our belonging to our group, uh, uh, the Tatas. Uh, and besides that, we contributed our salaries towards all those colleagues who unfortunately lost their jobs because they were either casual employees or, or employees on contract. None of our permanent employees were laid off. That's the value of our Tata group. However, there were some colleagues who are you know, working as casuals and contractual who were laid off because of the situation, but all of us contributed up to 30% of our salary towards looking after them. And more than 7,000 of our colleagues benefited to get a sustenance allowance of up to 50,000 rupees. So this is what we did. We set out rooms for COVID care. We, uh, we are hotels, we are not hospitals, but we, we changed our business model, opened up for, uh, for COVID care hospitals. We donated ventilators. We, we have donated 3 million meals during the lockdown. 3 million meals, you heard that right. And currently in the second wave, Mr. Kotla. Good. Hello. Hello. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
was I was listening to the talk about Tata, a very impressive talk. And are we going to be on time now for my talk? Yes, sir, we'll be on time. So okay. it's time to just introduce you, sir, first. Let me just, you know, invite you formally here. Uh, yes, uh, by the way, I want to put my uh, slides also on, mm -hmm. uh, on what is called the share screen. Yes, sir. And uh, let's stop. Uh, let me just see. If I'm on the share screen, yes, this would be, I think, the one. And what I would do is just move this up over here. Yes, sir. So it's visible. And then I want to be sure. No, this is not the, uh, the right one. Sorry about that. So the slides are visible. Well, I've got to get to the other slides. Um, All right. I want these slides. Okay, wait. And this is this is the right one. Okay. Yes. So can I now invite you formally, sir? Yes, you can. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Marketing takes a day to learn. Unfortunately, it takes a lifetime to master. Tonight, this task of producing this guest is a great privilege. I know this one is difficult, the thought that he's a man of virtue and simplicity. I feel elated to introduce him to everyone tonight. After all, he is a living inspiration to the young ones and the young ones. If one takes a closer look at the alchemy of the achieving person, two distinct virtues pop up. Besides perseverance and hard work, these are pioneering spirit and willingness. Yes, you guessed it right. He is none other than father and guru of marketing, the one who paved the way for the aspiring generation to understand the nitty gritties of marketing. He is Philip Kotler, our guest of honor of this evening. He's the S.C. Johnson Distinguished Professor of International Marketing at the Kellogg School of Management. He is called the father of modern marketing. He received his MA degree in economics in 1953 from the University of Chicago and his PhD degree in 1956 from MIT. He has received honorary degrees from 22 universities He's the author of 80 books and 150 journal articles. He has consulted many companies and lectures in many countries. He'll be sharing his pearls of wisdom on the topic company leadership and responsibility. So without any further ado, audience, join me in inviting the living legend of marketing industry, Mr. Philip Butler. So the audience is all yours virtually. Thank you very much uh, for a nice introduction. And I'm very excited about this opportunity to meet your students and uh, share some ideas with them. Uh, much, mm -hmm. of my, much of my talk will be guided by a set of PowerPoint slides that will, and please feel free to take any notes on them. Uh, this opening slide uh, is, is simply uh, my ego trip because I'm just mentioning a couple of my books uh, not my marketing books, of which more of them are marketing books, but my interest also in the bigger picture of a society and of the globe. And is capitalism working for us? Can we make capitalism better? Is our democracy working for us? Can we make it better? All with the idea of what is the common good? Obviously, the common good is about can we increase the happiness and the well-being of the people in the society. And what measures are positive in that way, namely that these are measures that would make life better for more people. Now, I would like to move on to talking about some history and development of business thinking, uh, because really I want us to get a picture of the good and the bad aspects of some business practices. And I'm gonna start with the robber barons, which was in the 1800s, 1850s and so on. The United States had some very, very powerful and successful people. Uh, we have to 
we have to grant them credit for building up industries that were going to launch us right into the industrial revolution. Uh, the, for example, Vanderbilt really put together the steamship lines and the railroads, and we needed that because our country is like your country, a large country. And then Andrew Carnegie, he practically owned the steel industry and was a, the richest man of all of them at the time. And JP Morgan, the banker, he actually saved the United States at one point by extending credit that we badly needed in, and so on. And Rockefeller's name is well known, but primarily because he owned the oil industry. He was so powerful with the oil industry. And Jay Gould was making money by doing interesting trades on the market. Now, uh, one of these people, Andrew Carnegie, uh, I wanna make just a simple point about him. He was a devil and an angel which is the nature of most, most of these billionaires. Uh, he paid the lowest wages to steel workers who toiled 12 hour shifts. He hired guards to break up the union. There were occasions of gunfire and people hurt. And Carnegie proudly said, I taught the workers a lesson they will never forget. Now that's the devil in the man. However, later in life, he, said, I've got to give back. I made a lot of money. And the normal thing, by the way, for billionaires was to give it back to their college or to uh, their religious institution. He said, no, I want to give it back in a way that would help more younger people uh, learn and, and be better educated. I will build public libraries. Now there weren't public libraries, uh, but he built them. In fact, he, there were not only I believe about 2000 libraries in the United States. And he went abroad and built libraries too. They're called Carnegie libraries. And the idea was to give young students a chance to read a book that might change their life. So this is something about the question of using the wealth for good purposes. Uh, very briefly, uh, we had to break up some of these monopolies. Every country knows that while there's one thing called healthy competition, and it's the best thing because it keeps everyone alert and it produces uh, positive disruptions and growth. So Teddy Roosevelt was our president who was our trust buster. And he went particularly after the oil industry and uh, broke up the John D. Rockefeller company into 34 separate companies. So we, we need uh, people like that. Uh, in government who take a, an advanced look at what, what is hurting citizens and what can help. And uh, he had, that, if you want to read a, a fantastic life story, uh, his principles were, were worth knowing about. But let me move on. Now, I want to put in Peter Drucker too, because we're talking about what makes good business and management. And who's the father of management? It's Peter Drucker. Uh, several books, every book worth rereading. Most books are not worth reading even the first time, but rereading because the way he, uh, he expresses things is so important. But I want to take just one aspect of Peter and his thinking about marketing. And no one has called him the, uh, a marketer. It's, I have called him the grandfather of marketing because he was early in his work on management recognizing that marketing was one of the most important functions. In fact, he said, the business enterprise has two and only two basic functions, marketing and innovation. Marketing and innovation produce results. All the rest are cost. By the way, management didn't like him for that statement because they thought production is important, finance is important, human resources are important. And here he, he says only the most important things are marketing and innovation. The purpose of uh, a company, he said, is to create a customer, which was itself a, a departure from the normal way we express the purpose of a company. Ask any businessman. The purpose of a company is to create profits. What 
does Drucker mean by saying it is to create customers? Well, of course, it becomes obvious. No customers, no profits. So the, the skill set is to understand the customer so well that you can build strong, appealing products that they, that they almost must have and buy. Drucker also said, the aim of marketing is to know and understand the customer so well that the product or service fits him and sells itself. Now, he is talking about the ideal, namely, a business should create something that people want badly enough to stand in line for. And you don't need any salesmen. You don't need any advertising. The moment they know that new car has been produced, I got to have it. And they stand in line and you don't need salesmen. All you need are order takers. Now that's a high aim. But what he was really saying is the aim of marketing is to make selling unnecessary. Now, this, this hit people between the eyes because they thought marketing is selling. So how could the aim of marketing be to end selling? But that's what he meant. The best way to predict the future is to create it. And if the gods wanted to destroy you, they would give you 20 years of success. <laughs> uh, that uh, You can't count on success being self-perpetuating. But let me move on to other thoughts. Um, and I'll do it by going forward, not backwards. Let's see what happened here. Okay, here we go. So in the history of our thinking about what the purpose is of a business, my own professor at the University of Chicago, Milton Friedman, had a major influence in the thinking of businessmen that lasts until this day. Freeman felt that the purpose of a business is to maximize profits and should not get distracted by social interests, sustainability, which was not even a word at the time. Um, namely, just make as much profit as you can, give it to the shareholders, and let those who get dividends then be givers. Leave the, the idea of the social problems to those people who have been rewarded nicely from the business to make their own choices of who should be supported. Okay. And he also felt that government was bad, that, it cre that when government interferes, it creates more problems than it solves. And uh, there are many quotes there. And I, I we want to uh, just say that if you are interested in, in any quotes that I have on my slides, just go back to quotations in, on the internet and look up Milton Friedman. You'll find these and many more famous statements made by Friedman. But the main thing about, uh, about what he did in terms of business thinking, he created the, uh, he worked on the idea of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is what Margaret Thatcher was teaching in England and what our business schools were teaching. Namely, let a business be free, markets should be free, business people can make all the decisions, leave them alone. That would be, leave a, the economy to be dynamic and growing at a good rate. So <clears throat> that's what we taught in business school. We basically said, um, keep government small, and, and let the businessmen be free to do what they want. And there was, by the way, some of you may know about a book by Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand, uh, who has quite a following called, um, um, uh, she wrote about that businessmen are, are, are greedy people, but their greed is good. Greed is good and altruism is bad. I mean, it's a whole dialogue that you might want to look at. Let me move on to the man who was judged to be the best manager of the century, Jack Welch, head of the big company called General Electric, who believed in a company hiring always the best people and getting rid of the unbest people. That, that part was called rank or yank. 
you either rank high because you've done good things or you will be yanked away for your own good. He was not, uh, he, he, he could say, if I know someone working for me who's not gonna go far in this company, but could go far in other companies, but not meet our standards, I'm doing him a favor by firing him. 10% of his managers would be asked to leave each year. So Jack Welch had a lot of principles, uh, busy thinking about vision, mission, and planning. Uh, and a lot of the tools that we teach in business school and management schools, um, like uh, be number one or number two in your market or, or get out. You're not going to make money if you're number three, uh, unless it's number three, you own a niche rather than that market. Lots of uh, interesting ideas about Jack Welch. Now, <clears throat> along comes um, a statement by a highly regarded manager who runs the biggest, one of the biggest funds, investment funds. It's called Black Rock Group, and he's the CEO. His name is Larry Fink. And in about 19, the late, the early 90s, I guess, the statement was made. I should have had the date. Society is demanding that companies, both public and private, serve a social purpose. Get that. Uh, so, sorry to, uh, so sorry to interrupt you, but the slides aren't moving. Uh, the slide is what? The slides aren't moving, sir. So there's a different slide on the screen and the different topic is being discussed. Oh, so oh I, I don't yes, know sir. why that is. Let me go back and see what, why, why that is. Here was a slide about Jack Welch. Is that the one you have now? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. What, give me the title of the one you have now. Marketing 5.0, Technology from Humanity. I know that's a different slide set. You don't even have this, this one loaded. You see, this one says, Jagannath International Management School, New Delhi. Are we on the right school? Yes, sir. And, and yet you don't have this. This oh, is CISA Journal Conference 2021, Seoul, South, South Korea. Yes, I know, but that was a talk I, I gave to South Korea, but that's not the talk I have for you. But this is the one which is shared on so the So we screen. can stop share and reshare. I think it will sort out the problem, sir. I can, I, can I, may, just... I can keep talking without it, but can I just try one thing? I, um, yes, sir. I am looking for where it said uh, share the slide. Hello? Next to chat uh, option. Oh, uh, yeah, let's see. Okay. A new share. No, there, wait, I have new share. new share. Okay. First, we'll have to stop this, then re and then share again. Okay. Uh, so, so we have to share that. Uh, how do we stop this? Oh, stop, share. stop yes, share. Yes, sir. Stop share. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, I just saw stop share, and again, uh, I just lost Re it. Uh, yes. I, I see the word share, but I don't see stop share now. Let's now see. It it's, it's, now you have to click share screen. Okay. Yeah. One second. Here. Let's share. And now do you have this one? Yeah, sir. So, yeah. Yes, sir. this one is right. Okay. Yes. Now yes. notice notice this. Uh, I'm glad you interrupted because it was called for. But basically, I can pick things up because this was Jack Welch. Yeah, this is it. Sir. Yes. Sir. Yeah, this one. Yes, sir. This is it. And and now I'm talking about Larry Fink. Now, all the businessmen in the past that I reviewed were talking about what's good for business, not what's good for society. We needed someone to come along. And in this case, it was Larry Fink, who was highly respected. And he, and he said, society is demanding that companies, both public and private, serve a social purpose. To prosper over time, every company 
must not only deliver financial performance, but also show how it makes a positive contribution to society. Now, we know some companies identify themselves with that statement. For example, Starbucks. Starbucks really cares about people being um, happy and satisfied and actually it treats its own employees in such a way that it encourages them to go to college and helps them get into college. Unilever, which I will say more about, is an outstanding company. Levi Strauss, Nike, Body Shop, Patagonia, Ben and Jerry. So without Larry Fink making this statement, there were always some companies thinking more broadly about social responsibility. And then the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, and the president who started it, the founder is Klaus Schwab, came into the same mindset. <clears throat> and at the World Economic Forum, where business leaders often gather once a year, and academics as well, uh, they met together, the business leaders, and they worked on a thing called stakeholder capitalism metrics. Because Schwab and others began to say, we must move from what is called shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. Now, stake, shareholder capitalism means it's all about rewarding the investors, the share. The shares are the owners. The owners ought to have all the profits. Now, you can actually say that's true. Profits should go to the ones who invested the money and hold the stock. But maybe if you do it by paying hardly anything to the workers, hardly anything to, to, to get good suppliers, you're making a mistake. You're keeping all your costs down, trying to maximize your profits for the shareholders when you would do, and this is important, your profits would be higher if you were stakeholder oriented and chose the best workers, chose the best suppliers, cared about the community, cared about the society, you'll make more money for everyone, including the shareholders. So the World Economic Forum did what is called a great reset. And I think a book was issued called The Great Reset by Schwab about the new thinking of business. Now, moving on. Along comes an interesting book. I wish I had written it. They didn't, the team didn't invite me to do that, although I know all of them very well and have great respect. The book is called Firms of Endearment. And you might try this idea for India. Their idea was to identify companies in the United States at the time that were loved by Americans, that there was a love affair. Now, I'll give you one example. If you ever go into a Apple store, you can hardly get in. Night and day, people are playing around with the appliances and talking to each other, and they love Apple. So a student might say, I don't know if I can go on living if Apple disappeared. Now, you could do this in India. You could say, what are the 25 companies in India that people feel very close to and proud of working with and respect their products and so on. Because when that was done in the United States, these three uh, researchers asked, is there anything common to these firms that are loved, that are firms of endearment? Yes, they were all highly profitable. They outperformed their competitors by a ratio of nine to one over a 10 year period. And the main tangible answers is, these companies had more happy and motivated employees, happy and loyal customers, more innovative and profitable suppliers and environmentally healthy communities. So you might try this in India. What are the 25 most beloved com companies and what might be 
common to them and are they generally more profitable and the people working for them happier? So let's move on. Um, I, I want to go here now. This is a, um, a, a very good contribution to uh, a book called Conscious Capitalism uh, by, again, Raj Sasodia, who was an author of the book I just mentioned. Um, but John McKay was in the food business, and he opened a grocery called Whole Foods, and it was healthy food. For the first time, instead of a grocery having good and bad stuff, you know, that you should, because you, you eat good and bad things for your health, but uh, this was going to be organically grown products and, uh, and, and, and good things for you. So there's a big following. And these two people tried to put together principles and they started an organization. They hoped it would be a major movement in the United States. It's not a major movement. It's got a lot of followers. They call it conscious capitalism. And the four principles of cap uh, conscious capitalism are first, having a higher purpose than profits. Yes, profits are a purpose, but you have another purpose that's higher. Why? In other words, why do you exist as a company? What else is behind that interest to, to go and be troubled by running a company and, and financing it and so on? Secondly, stakeholders are all being served and work together very well. The leader himself or herself is very conscious of building a culture. And there, the, there is a conscious culture and management throughout the organization, wherever it's located in any part of the world, it's a shared culture. So you might want to see more about that book in your readings. Now, the next thing is, I've done a number of books that have to do with social purpose. The one called Corporate Social Responsibility came out of studying 45 companies in the US that said they were socially responsible. So we naturally we said, well, what, 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 in what way are you helping with social problems? And each one gave answers. Normally they said they not only gave away some money, but they had a cause, a particular cause Let's say Coca-Cola said, you know, we depend on water. We can't make Coke without it. And there's a problem around the world of water shortage and water quality. So we, we feel responsible for making water more available and better. <clears throat> well, so we learned a great deal and the book summarizes the behavior of companies that care about different types of problems. Then uh, recently we published a book called Brand Activism. It's another book on branding of which there are 250 books, but, and all of them are interesting. Ours is to say the brand should be active. It should show purpose that leads to action. Now behind that statement is this. I as a consumer want to know something about the company that I will buy something from. I don't want to buy from a cigarette company. I don't like the idea of people smoking and killing themselves and killing others who stand near the smoke. Uh, but basically, uh, what are your values as a company? Are, are they clear to your employees and to the outsiders? If I'm going to buy a car <clears throat> and I don't think you care much about safety, you don't say design safety in, in the, in the car concept, then I may not buy your car. So brand activism is full of lots of stories of companies that are wanting to reveal transparently what they care about. So you, if you care about the same thing, would connect with that company. Okay, now uh, let's move on a little more. And I want to feature Paul Pullman and Unilever. Paul Pullman was the CEO for 10 years of the, you have the lever company in India for forever you've had it. 
Unilever is around the world, of course. Let's look at some of his statements. A company must define its purpose and value proposition. You know, that gets to, isn't the purpose to create value? What is your, what value are you creating? The purpose is to create real value for all the stakeholders. It answers why, the purpose is why you exist. Vision is what you do, want to achieve and mission is how to achieve it. And you know, such a company has to decide who are the stakeholders. Normally you say, oh, it's just the customers and the investors and thirdly, the employees. It's three, three groups. You're trying to satisfy the investors, the employees and the customers. He says that we have seven stakeholders, consumers, customers, business partners, suppliers, agencies, communities, the planet is a customer. The planet is one of our stakeholders and the shareholders. And he says they're being listed in order of importance. Ironically, where, where did he put shareholders? Not first. Get it in, in colleges, in business schools, we put shareholders first. He puts them last, but they get rewarded amply. Then he implemented an ambitious plan for the company. Notice this. He said, for the next year, we're gonna double our company's growth. We're gonna cut in half our environmental bad impact and triple our work to improve social impact. And the plan succeeded with annual sales rising from 38 billion to 60 billion during his management. So every year he cared about more than profits and it shows. You know what? He told the finance people in, in the country, I'm not even going to tell you what I'm going to earn this coming year. You don't, don't nag me about every quarter saying, oh, I'm going to uh, achieve profits this quarter so much. And then if I miss it by a dollar, you're going to curse me and, I, and my stock will go down. So you're not going to know what I plan to achieve. But at the end of the year, judge me. And he said, I'm looking for higher purpose driven people. Notice he's looking for employees, but those with a higher purpose because younger people, and he knew that the future is in the hands of, of generation Z and the alpha generation, the, the people in their, in their 20s and so on and so forth. And those are the ones you buy, you have to hire carefully. And he wanted to hire those who were purpose-driven people who combined profitability, an interest in sustainability, and an interest in social problems. And for every brand, he said to every brand manager, define the purpose of your brand. For example, one of their brands is, uh, is uh, Dove, and, it, and it's to make help women feel pretty and beautiful uh, through their skincare products and their soap and so on and so forth. Uh, ben and Jerry's, of course, to make people happy with ice cream. But the point is to put a purpose behind every uh, brand, but, not on, but also against every division. One of its big divisions is called foods, but they now call it future foods division. And then it also has, it does cleaning products. They call it Clean Futures Division. So you can see how enlightened that company is. Okay, I'm almost uh, finished uh, carrying you through this journey of business thinking because I want to quote one more company. This is a friend of mine, the CEO, he's the ex-CEO now of YKK. And everyone is close to YKK because if you're wearing anything with a zipper, like, or a woman would have a purse and it has a zipper. YKK makes most of the zippers of the world. It is uh, the basic, it's a, it's a tough thing to be able to make very good zippers and YKK is the company. But he calls his the business a cycle of goodness. That running a business is to create a cycle of goodness for all the people in the business, not just the investors. If you look at the yellow box briefly 
on the left, you'll see that he wants his workers not only to get a wage. See, most businesses want to just give them a wage. If they need, if it isn't enough, they should go and borrow money and, and buy things with debt. No, he wants them to be a wage earner and also to have a savings plan and also to have stock, either stock in, in YKK or in other companies. He wants an employee to be a part owner of a business in a sense and to think business. So that's one cycle of goodness. Now, if you look at the far right, you'll see a number of things that he does contributes to social contribution. Of course, the taxes he pays and the philanthropy he gives. So as you go through that chart, you will see that it's a very enlightened framework for a company to manage a business. So where are we? I try to describe that new ideas are coming into what is a business and what is good management and to what extent should it be only a pro about profits? And my answer was no, it should be also about sustainability of the environment. You're building a business that will pass on to the next generation and make the next generation better than I, even our generation, if possible. And the purpose is to uh, make the world a better place, not to ignore social problems as if the business has no concern with them. So I end with the last slide, which is one that I use often in talks about business. And I say to a company, within five years from now, if you're in the same business, you're doing it the same way that you're, you're going to be out of business, basically. The world is changing very fast. And um, you can't survive by just making five years from now the same products you are making now. They better be better products and there better be more of them. Namely, innovation and marketing are the two most functions that your business needs for growth and profitability. Thank you very much. Now, I'm sorry the earlier slides were not discussed, but you can, uh, what, uh, my talk was supposed to last about this time, I may be overrunning. What do you suggest? Who is our moderator? Sorry, hello, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. It, it was a wonderful session. Thank you for the slides and the books that you have mentioned and the kind of analysis that you've given us regarding the management and the marketing part. Uh, now it's time to invite our chairman, our anchor of the ship. Let me just, you know, briefly describe him this way. Before Shikha, you're a lead. Shikha, yes, I was just wondering if students want to ask a few questions okay. and if Professor Cotter right, has sir. more time for the students. All right, sir. Okay, let's let's have a Q&A session first and then I'll invite you, sir. Uh, Professor Kotler, is it okay with you if students want to ask a few questions? Yes, of course. Uh, I always like to hear from students. I learn okay. from them. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. So let's go ahead with the question and answer session first. Vibhur Kataria, your question first. Please unmute yourself. Am I audible, sir? You are audible. I can hear you. Hello, sir. Namaste from India. Hello. I really want to uh, compliment you, sir, for your sense of humor. And I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the whole presentation. Uh, so my question is, uh, what global examples would you suggest as role models for Indian companies to work in the area of company leadership and responsibility? Well, you know, uh, it's interesting that the ones I chose were as models that work around the world is Unilever and is YKK. And in your country, I would say Tata is definitely a model for good business thinking. Uh, Reliance has been a fabulous kind of company uh, and, and should be studied too. And I uh, agree that um, uh, India is going through a very tough period now uh, with COVID and we just cross our fingers that things get better. Uh, but when I heard about Tata and the kinds of things that their CEO is doing, 
they were smart things to do uh, with a terrible uh, situation. Um, but I, I, I like the idea you, you're raising, namely, try to find companies that you, you can learn something from because they are not simply profit machines. They are machines for making the world a better place. So those are some of my uh, nominations. Yes. Another okay. question. Yes, sir. so there is a question from Professor Uma Gulati. Yes. Go ahead. Uma ma'am, please can yeah, yeah, you unmute yeah, yeah. yourself? Yeah, good evening, sir. Yes, good evening. My gratitude to you. My gratitude to you. My question is, keeping in mind the faculty fraternity of marketing, sir, can you please tell some emerging areas where marketing faculty can carry on the research, some new emerging areas? Well, yes, uh, there's a lot of work being done in voice and facial uh, marketing. Uh, you know, the voice part has to do with uh, when you have a cell phone, uh, you could probably... Uh, my cell phone has a woman called uh, Siri. And I say, Siri, what time is it? Siri, uh, what is happening? And in, in, give me some information about Germany or something like that. So that's voice. So it's wonderful that the human voice can be immediately translated and go to a data bank and, and answer and have someone answer questions. There's a lot of work now on facial recognition, uh, partly just to see the face of the customers when they come, the face comes back again and again uh, to your attention, but uh, also because the face reveals emotions. And now this may be an invasion of privacy too. And there are big questions now because ever since we entered the digital revolution, uh, we have argued that our job as marketers is to know as much about a person as possible to see if we should even bother them with our ads. You know, you don't want to uh, bother people who, will, who, let's say you're selling a, uh, you're selling a Mercedes car. There's a lot of people who couldn't never be interested in that or buy it. So the more, the more we know about uh, um, customers, uh, we know who to target. It's called targeting. Well, so the point is that um, it's our excuse as marketers that we ought to collect a lot of information about each person, but that also invades their privacy as well and can lead to manipulation that we, we, we can tempt them in the ways we know they could be tempted and so on and so forth. So marketing is in a kind of a, a state of debate about how far uh, can we go with getting un to understand people deeply without violating uh, their areas of privacy and concern? Okay, I don't know if that if I'm still with your question, but that that that's what's Thank happening. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Thank you. Moving on to the next question, Rona, could you please unmute yourself? So first of all, uh, yes. I would like to tell you that uh, it has been an honor to talk to you, to get to know you, sir, because I even, uh, I'm a university student and I read your book on marketing management and to talk to you in person is like a dream come true for me. Thank so you. my question to you is, uh, as an aspirant uh, who wants to make his uh, global career in marketing, what is what should be our vision for the next 10 years post-pandemic? Yes. Okay. Um, here's the way you should uh, choose. There's a big question about whether you want to be in marketing or finance or human resources or something else. But let's say you, you, you feel that marketing will bring you two things. One is more interaction with other people and you like a, a life full of people. And secondly, that uh, it, it's, a, it's a field where that can make contributions to the quality of life of people. You know, we often say marketing raised the standard of living in the world by convincing people to have modern refrigerators and washing machines and drive good cars and so on and so forth. So let's say it is marketing that you want to focus on, but you should really enter that field with an idea of what part of it 
to enter because it has uh, many rooms. Uh, do you want to be the, a marketing researcher, um, which is growing because we want to get to know our customers very well? Or do you want to be a, a message designer, a, person, a, a good communicator who can create copy that motivates people to be interested in a new car that you have or something like that? Or do you want to take a financial view of marketing uh, because you, you want to major both in finance and marketing and, and, and know how to really uh, get a measure of the uh, marketing return on investment you know, that financial kind of thing. Uh, well, whatever it is, uh, be clear about starting in marketing in one of those rooms. And then if you are hoping to become a CMO, eventually the chief, a chief marketing officer, it's very important to be digital. We're in a digital age. And if you're more locked into traditional marketing, which is knowing how to do 30 second commercials and uh, print advertising, uh, that's not enough. So the CEO has to have a very broad view. Uh, now, if you're interested at, eventually in being a CEO of a company, you need, uh, you, you, you need to not only be good at digital, but you have to be good at innovative thinking and creative thinking and gather a lot of people like that around you uh, because you may want to not buy a company uh, and be its CEO. You may want to start a company and be its CEO. So that's, that's big picture thinking. And that's really a matter of forecasting and future, future. You're almost a futurist. Where is the world, world going? What is it going to need? Particularly the question now is going to be, COVID will end at some point. Are we going to return to the old normal or a new normal? And it will be a new normal. But what will be its character? After all, people have been shut up a lot. And they've been even working at home, even if they're still employed. But what's the new normal? And where do you cash in on the new normal if you're going to start a company or join the right company to be at? So good luck in your pursuit of that question. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Another question. Uh, Anish, can you please unmute yourself? Uh, good evening, sir. sir my good evening. Is, do you think that the government policies can be a determinant or the catalyst for corporate social responsibility? Uh, um, would you repeat the question? I missed something. So uh, I was asking that, do you think that co uh, government policies could be a uh, can be a deterrent or the catalyst for corporate social responsibility? Well, uh, what I heard, you're asking about government policy, right? Yeah, I'm asking that it can be a catalyst or how it would affect the corporate social responsibility. Oh, okay. Yes, I see. How can, it, should government play a role at all in um, furthering companies in India to think about social problems and sustainability. And if it is to play a role, how can it expedite the interest of, uh, of companies in, in taking social responsibility? Should, <laughs> should the government give a prize each year to the 10 companies that did the best new, show the, the best new ideas for solving social problems, you know? Like, I think one of the best solutions that we've had recently, if it had been a contest, is what Bill Gates and, um, uh, and Warren Buffett created called the Giving Pledge. If you know the Giving Pledge, he got 200, they got 214 billionaires each to agree to go public and be on, on the internet and, and to pledge giving away half their money in the next 10 years. Now, that was a brilliant idea that government should have pushed even if Bill Gates didn't come up with the idea. So maybe there is a department in, in government that can think actively about how to get more companies to show a caring about, the, about sustainability and the environment and the future. And, and then contact these companies and say, you know, you, you could be a great help in, in our environmental uh, problems 
if you would get your people more behind it. So I think there's a role to be played, but we have to be thoughtful about what, who should play it in government, what kind of department and so on. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It was indeed a wonderful session. Now, finally, I have to invite our Honorable Chairman, Dr. Amit Gupta. Yes. He's an eminent, he's an eminent educationist and outstanding scholar, but also an excellent sports person. He's a commerce graduate from Sri, uh, Sri Ram College of Commerce and an MBA from Institute of Foreign Trade. His doctorate degree was awarded by GGSIP University, and he also does Seed Transformation Immersion Program from Stanford University and Building an Unorship Education Ecosystem from Babson University. Wonderful. Inspired by the ideal of making education meaningful to the times laid the foundation of a modern, professionally run institution of higher learning, Jagannath International Management, with campuses spread all over Delhi and adjoining states of Haryana, UP, and Rajasthan. He has yes. been honored with many national and international bodies. He was selected among 2,000 outstanding intellectuals of 21st century by International Biographical Center, Cambridge, England. He was also conferred the prestigious title of Man of the Year by the American Bibliographical Institute and Shiksharatan Award and Gold Medal by Institute of Economic Studies for his outstanding contribution to the development of education in India. He's a member of Entrepreneurs Organization, Rotary International Roundtable, and a recent feather in his cap was being honored with the prestigious Outstanding Rotarian Award 2016-17 for serving humanity. I request Dr. Amit Gupta to pay our heartiest gratitude to Mr. Philip Kotler. Hello, Amit. Nice to meet you. Pleasure is entirely mine, sir. In fact, I wanted to tell everyone that when I started my MBA program, your book was the first one I read, the modern marketing principles of marketing. So oh, thank you. Thank you. But uh, please uh, tell uh, students uh, that, uh, that every three to four years, we try to update our books because someone came up to me recently and said, he he's, was a CEO of a company. And he said, I had your, one of your first books maybe the first edition, and I still use it. I said, how could you use it? There's nothing about branding in it. There's nothing about digital. Absolutely. I mean, please buy the next copy. I mean, I'm not, I don't need your money, but I think you need uh, the 15th edition. And he, so uh, that's another thing. Thank you. I'm, I, I'm not saying that you should get the 15th edition. I'm just saying, tell other people that they should stay up to date. Thank you. Absolutely. So in fact, digital marketing, like you also pointed out, is the key these days. Thank you so much. Uh, in fact, just to summarize what you said, you know, how do we really move from shareholders to stakeholders? And how do we really move from profitability to sustainability? I think really? that's the yeah, role of leaders. We need to reorient ourselves. So COVID has taught us a lot of things and I would not really spend a lot of time because you have already shared your knowledge. So did the speakers before you. I don't know if the chief guest, Mr. Rohit Khosla is still with us. I heard him and so uh, Mr. Justin Paul, professor, University of Puerto Rico. Uh, so these were the wonderful speakers. We had a lot of learning, but just to be very brief, I would like to emphasize upon four to five things which all of us need to focus now in the post-COVID era. We've seen a lot of changes, the kind of second wave India witnessed. We really had a lot of issues both at the societal level as well as at the professional corporate level. But it has also taught us a few things. And the bottom line which I feel which Professor Kotler also mentioned is that we need to create the conditions for innovation and resilience. So one of the main imperatives as a business leader is to keep our company innovative. That not, not only means putting our money into innovation, but it also means creating a culture that supports innovation. So as a leader, we need to ask that, how can I have as many people as possible trying out new things in order to maximize the number of different ideas that are available? And beyond this, we need to embed resilience which does not mean just, you know, keep our operations moving. It also means that we develop a point of view onto the future and adapting quickly to the changing circumstances and building on our strengths. In fact, 
the companies that are most resilient are sometimes that are able to double down on their existing competencies mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the second point of view i have is that there are now funds available from different sources though we feel that you know post covid the funds are not easily available but for any new entrepreneurial idea or a project there are still a lot of companies who are willing to invest so we need to consider the problems that the world is facing and how do we look for an alternate solution how can we really fit these solutions or add these solutions into our business and having an entrepreneurial mindset i believe is the key we need to take some risk we need to really look at some new opportunities and we should not be scared of our failures and if we have the right ideas there are a lot of investors who are waiting to make decisions and i believe that yes there is a time of opportunity even in the post covid area we see the wonderful example of tata how they really converted i would say perhaps the segment which was most affected into a segment which was just least affected and from 15% how they really rose to 72% just a matter of one year uh third i believe as a leader as a ceo we need to really bring purpose to the fore a lot of our team members now need to be told that what exactly the company stands for and what is going to happen how do we really bring sense of value that can really help people imagine the next couple of years what are we you know what are they going to be like for them if how do we invent how do we reinvent ourselves and where should we work whether we should working from home whether we should work from office or we need to have a hybrid model so all these things i think need to be told to our team members we need to give them flexibility and we also need to tell them that yes performance is the key we really can't especially in the post covid areas have any kind of wastage of resources whether financial or manpower fourth i believe is we also need to rethink our approach to the crisis management you know leaders of fortune 500 companies they generally tend to be ill prepared for crisis but yet they are very very confident that they can handle everything and i think that's the kind of confidence we also need to have at all levels that even if we don't have a very specific action plan in place we can handle any kind of crisis let's face that crisis with our team members involved at every level and i'm sure once we are able to handle any crisis management then in the next few years we'll be able to outgrow most of our competitors last but i believe which is very important we also need to prioritize well being of all our individuals you know today high stress levels are the top of mind of all the employees but if we really do care for them and if we also ensure that we send a strong message that yes the company is interested in the well being of each and every stakeholder shareholder and we don't ignore them then i'm sure as a team as a group as an organization we can really face this challenge in a much much more successful way these were the few thoughts uh, i wanted to share with all of you thanks for listening to me patiently and once again thank you so much professor gotler it has been an honor thank you, thank you and i'm so glad i had the chance to hear you because your thoughts are wonderful i i thought of so many things as you were talking about these four points of yours and they were so well expressed that it should be just circulated to the other people who may have missed what you think is so important to to be good citizens and 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 prosperous people uh and so on so thank you for sharing that thank you uh, thank you thanks to all of you for this opportunity to meet some very bright people uh, enthusiastic questions came and i um uh, hope the best happens to your uh your university or your people and so on thank you again thank you so much sir thank, thank you we're you deeply humbled and honored to have you sir thank you very much thank you so thank much you dr gupta thank, thank you sir thank you bye bas namaste unfortunately we couldn't get enough time with uh, mr rohit khosla uh we are hoping that we soon going to have him either in this session or probably we're going to have a separate session with rohit kotla sir so that he could share his thoughts on the that hotel the ppt that he was sharing with us so apologies for that glitch mr rohit kotla um uh, moving ahead is the valedictory session
Of course, we've been waiting since morning. Uh, there was a technical session, four technical sessions that had happened. So it's time to announce the result. We've been listening to eminent speakers and uh, all these valuable insights gave us new perspective that one should adopt while discussing these issues today is difficult scenario. We had four great technical sessions with 42 presenters who beautifully came out with their ideas and queries for other presenters. The zeal, enthusiasm, and intellect of all speakers and presenters were commendable, thanks to our session chairs and co-chairs and presenters. It was a difficult session for our, you know, it was a difficult decision for our jury to choose the best paper and presenter. The jury has evaluated the paper of all the four technical sessions, so here is the result with me. Let me start with the first technical session. In the first technical session, Aru Shokin, research scholar of Singhania University, Junjunu, Rajasthan, Anshu Lohab, assistant professor, Maharaja Surajmal Institute, Delhi, and Puram Khurana, associate professor, Vips, Delhi, for the paper titled Empirical Investigation of the Relationship Between Personality Traits and Fashion Consciousness Among College-Going Students in India. So here's the certificate placed on the screen for Poonam Khurana, Anshu Lohab, and Arush Shokin. They've bagged the best research paper award in the technical session first. Moving on to the second technical session, we have two papers in this, in this session. First paper is by Debo Priya Neg, a research scholar, Department of Management, J, JJIT University, Rajasthan. Professor C. L. Sharma, Professor, Department of Management, JJT University, Rajasthan. Iris Saxena, Associate Professor, Department of Management, Devatova University, Ethiopia, for their paper titled, Intersection of Battle and Marketing Strategies from Tribal Warfare in South Africa, a Qualitative Study Using Thematic Analysis. And the second position being uh, backed by... Sorry, uh, Shikha, sorry to interrupt you. Actually, there is one announcement for all the participants. We are sharing yes. the link for your participation certificate in the chat box. So you may just fill in that link and get the participation certificate. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. So there's a, particip uh, there's a certificate uh, link which is being shared in the chat box. You're requested to fill that to attain your participation certificate. Moving on to the second position that I was describing. Sakshi Chabra, student of Jims Vasant Kunj and Ms. Sonia Gandhi, assistant professor Jims Vasant Kunj for their paper titled Post-COVID Era Impact on Marketing Activities. This was the papers that were selected as the best paper award for the te second, second, uh, second technical session. And for the third one, we have Akanksha, a student of Gita Ratan International Business School, and Dr. Seema Vadhavan, Associate Professor of Jims Vasant School, for their paper titled Role of Transformational Leadership and Employee Performance Amid COVID-19 Crisis. Congratulations to all the winners from all the three sessions. Moving on to the last technical session. Priyanka Guest Faculty of Commerce, Department of Evening Studies, Multidisciplinary Research Center, Punjab University, Chandigarh, and Gurpreet Kaur, Junior Research Fellow of University Business School, Punjab University, Chandigarh, for their paper titled Decomposition of International Economic Linkages Among Top 5 GDP Holder Country Stock Market After the Spread of COVID-19. So these are the winners of our four technical sessions. Congratulate to all the winners. I guess the audience can give them a virtual applause for the effort that they have made in writing such an amazing paper. Now, I would like to invite our conference convener, the lady with vision and dream, who has the power to turn them into reality. She is Dr. Anu Bhartwaj. I request ma'am to propose a word of thanks. Thank you, Shikha. So, good evening, everyone. According to St. Ambrose, no duty is more urgent than that of returning thanks. So on behalf of Jagannath International Management School and Department of Management Studies, I feel honored and privileged to get the opportunity to propose the word of thanks on this special day. I would like to extend my heartiest thanks to all those who have directly or indirectly contributed in planning and organizing the 17th International Conference on Management Strategies, Retrieval, Resilience, and Remodeling in a post-COVID world. 
today my words are not enough to express the gratitude towards our guest of honor professor philip cotler father of modern marketing so we were blessed to have your presence i must mention it was a dream come true for most of us thank you sir for enlightening us with such amazing and thought provoking ideas i also wish to extend a special thanks to our chief guest mr rohit kosla for taking time out from his busy schedule and for such an insightful session we are sorry because of some technical glitch it got disconnected in between we'll certainly get reconnected sir and uh, we'll be you know having more of your sessions i would also like to extend my generous thank to all our eminent speaker mr sanjay bhan mr neeraj balia dr justin paul dr viola mr luke and dr munish chindal for sparing the valuable time and sharing the word of wisdom i also take this opportunity to thank our session chairs dr richa nangya dr amit gupta sorry dr nimit gupta dr manish shrivastava and professor arvind kumar for providing his invaluable comments and help towards the improvement of quality of paper presented in the conference it has been a pleasure to host all the participants of the conference i would like to share that in the morning session 42 research papers were presented by the academicians and research scholar from various part of world and th i'm thankful to all the participants for sharing their research work and attending the conference i'm sure that the participants must have been benefited by attending this conference i am very much thankful to our sponsors who have helped and provided us the invaluable support i am gratified to our honorable chairman dr amit gupta for his guiding force always i would also like to express my sincere thank to dr ravi kethar director gems vasant kunj for his continuous guidance and motivation thank you sir i would indeed be failing my duties if i do not express my sincere gratitude to head department of management studies dr nidhi gupta for her constant support sincere leadership and the confidence that she always instill in her team to make such events successful i would also like to express my gratitude towards the entire team who worked hard day and in and day night to make this whole event successful especially our co conveners dr shruti and mr vipul singh our creative and social media expert dr shalu tandon our host and technical head mr pramod pande our coaches dr himani gupta dr seema vadhavan dr shruti bhutani and mr vipul singh our session coordinators dr prabjot ms nisha vadavan ms swati mathur and ms sonia gandhi our mc of the day ms shikha thank you shikha for a wonderful job you've done and dr seema and divya for the morning sessions thank you both ms anshu for her consistent technical support and excellent coordination with all the paper presenters our reporters of the day mr gaurav ms chitra shrivastava ms pooja madan and mr priyanka uh, priyanka atri and last but not the least dr ashok sharma and mr deep biswas for all the background support special thanks to mr vipul ms jasmeet and abhin for providing such valuable guest thank you sir thank you ma'am i would also like to appreciate our academic assistants mr raman mandal ms rinki and mr saurabh for all the administrative support last but not the least an event like this cannot take place overnight the wheels start rolling weeks before we have been fortunate enough to be backed by the wonderful team of students so uh, my thanks is not enough guys you have really done a tremendous job navita kohli rishel vibhor abhin anish megha and all the other students whom i am not able to take because of the paucity of time thank you guys thank you so much we all have made a lot of efforts to make this whole thing successful last but not the least i would also like to thank all our students audience for being so patient and disciplined during the entire conference so i once again thanks everyone whose contribution had made this conference successful thank you thank you shikha thank you ma'am there's a wonderful quote from benjamin franklin there are three sorts of people in the world those who are immovable people who don't get it or don't want to do anything about it there are people who are movable people who see the need for change and are prepared to listen to it and there are people who move people who make things happen and if we can encourage more people that will be a movement 
And if the movement is strong, that's the best sense of the world, a revolution. And that's exactly what we need, where we are revolutionized to become a new normal today. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for being such a patient audience. Thank you to all our speakers, teachers, our chairman, director, head department, management studies, all the faculties. This is Shikha Kukreja signing off. Stay safe, stay healthy, take care. Thank you, everyone. This is the link. I think most of you have already generated your uh, certificates. Kindly use this to generate your participation certificate. Everybody, please don't forget to fill. Please uh, fill the Google form of the participation link for the generation of your e-certificate. I think I'm going to move on to you.